Cookie? Yeah. Cookie Googleman? Yeah. Does this ring a bell? I'm not wearing underwear. Bulge. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> Bulge? Yeah. Get out of town. <laughs> it's me. You look fantastic. You too. <clears throat> You've grown. I'm growing right now, girl, just looking at you. That is the one and only time I've ever done it on a roller coaster. Hello, folks. Welcome to the City Beat Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Gary Hill. Uh, alone again in the introduction here, but that's uh, that's more than fine. So you'll hear many more people on this episode. I'm looking forward to you guys checking that out. Uh, first of all, thank you for, for joining us. Uh, this is part two of the Beefiversary, and our CRISPR guest uh, exploding all in your face. I don't have a name for the CRISPR guest thing. It's just uh, it's a celebration, and um, that's good shit, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> This is uh, the fun part of the show for me. Uh, it might be a new segment of the show uh, to replace my uh, what you've been watching. This might be a Patreon thing. I don't know. Give a little extended reviews on these. Um, I decided to do the horror and the horrible uh, question mark on the, the horrible. You never can tell. Uh, I don't watch a lot of new horror, so I think it would be fun for me to do to, to review uh, a new horror film with very little spoilers and uh, review something that could be terrible in an older film more than likely and um it might be really good uh the, 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 the one in question is uh kind of in the middle because it kind of um yeah <laughs> but uh the first film i'm going to review for that is a brand new horror film uh that's out in in taiwan in selected theaters i think right now uh comes to shutter on the 12th so i'll keep this, my spoilers um Brief and hopefully just little little existent in this movie. Uh, it's one of the cool kids are talking about called The Sadness. Uh, this film is a film in which um, they take a take on the pandemic that that turns into like as a whole. I don't want to call them zombies. They're 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 calling it a zombie film, but I wouldn't call it a zombie film because they're more like infected with a uh, like a rage virus that makes the 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 limbic system go nuts and make them want to kill people. In horrible, bloody, bloody ways and make their sex drives go crazy so they want to rape people. And this this film, uh, f- first of all, not for the squeamish. Uh, if, if you do not like blood and stuff like uh, eyeball um, um, removal and rape, uh, male and female, um, yeah, there's that. Uh, testicle smashing in this movie. There's all kinds of nasty movies. Some guy gets hit in the face with some fry grease and his face starts to melt so the, the, the infected person starts to tear his skin off and you see everything. My gosh. Uh, the crux of this film is basically this this couple trying to get back to each other. You know, once she leaves for work and he finds out that this thing is going on, they're, they're searching for each other. So you're basically following these two people through the whole run around the city and seeing all this craziness and it's 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 really wild shit but i i, I wouldn't i wouldn't recommend it for everybody it, it reminds me a lot of the film i'd be a long time ago i forget with who called the taint it's a trauma produced film about uh, a like a virus that gets loose via like like the omega man type situation that makes dudes into like uh overly misogynistic pricks who want to kill women and it ends with it, uh, your protagonist in the film is like this skateboarding douchebag who I think at the end of the movie I'm, I'm not gonna watch the taint again because it was it was kind of really stupid, but they have il- like enlarged penises like ridiculous penises and he has to shoot the heads off these dicks to make them die to like kill these people and if you watch something on, on the the, the um, more playful side of ridiculous. Ridicu- ridiculousness you could watch um the taint as well but um the sadness um again it comes to shutter on the 12th so if you have shutter you can watch it there um i don't want to give a crazy amount away because it's it's a uh, it's very simplistic in, in nature it's nothing you really haven't seen before as far as plot goes but as far as like gonzo violence it, it's just like yeah <sighs> The only issue I have, and um, I listened to the Cult of Muscles review of this movie, and they, they were 100% correct. Once you get about two-thirds of the way through this movie, you have a subplot where there's a lot of exposition that's had. That's when the film takes a dip into the slow side, and you're not really caring what happens next, because nothing really happens after this dip happens a lot. It, 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 it hurts the film, but all the stuff before it is just a gory fucking mess, so... 
if you're interested in the sadness, uh, comes a high recommend to me to uh, to check out. Um, go 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 do that uh, when it comes to Shutter if you haven't saw it already. Um, the the horrible uh, segment of, of this. I watched a film called The Day of the Dolphin, which is a film that stars George C. Scott. Um, your basic plot of this movie is he is a, a guy who works with dolphins, and he is teaching the dolphins how to communicate with humans, like, like secretly, because he doesn't want the government to um, corrupt his work or use them for nefarious means. But uh, wouldn't you know it? You know, once once the government stooges start to, starts to question the money they're giving him, and you know what's what's going on with the money, what's our results? Uh, the government stooges get fucking curious as hell. And there's a whole plot in here where they come to visit, and they're gonna take these uh, these dolphins for nefarious things, uh, i.e., using them to assassinate the president. <laughs> yeah, it's nuts. But you know what? I'll tell you one thing about this film: it has beautiful island locations, first of all. So if if you watch this, this is a Mike Nichols film, so it's a very legit, you know, thing. It's based on a book I've never read before, but um. George C. Scott in this movie is, is doing the, the, the best he can with, you know, a plot you wouldn't normally see him in. You know, playing this scientist who cares deeply for these animals. And there's a point where he, he brings a female dolphin in to get, to get a more chatty. So the, the whole idea of them having the mate and, you know, them, I'd imagine they're going to breed these animals. They're successful in their assassination skills. It's a ridiculous subplot to this movie. But it's, it's not, it's not, um... It's not unsound to, to, to say that the, if dolphins were as smart, and they are very smart creatures, but if they could follow human commands, would they c follow those human commands to a T? Would they find out in the end that you don't know because they're, they're, they're not that stupid? They, they, they could do the job, but they only follow the people they trust, which is our, our character uh, played by George C. Scott and his, his team. And um, it's really... It, this sounds like a really dull, dull plot, and, and let me tell you, it, it's not. It, it's it's very interesting. You know, we got a lot of stuff, you know, like in the 80s and the early 90s about, you know, animals and what they could do, uh, i.e. So like Free Willy and like Project X. But this is like a first film, you know, like that, to, to where you can see, you know, how, how they can use for science and stuff like that, and the personalities and the, 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 the wiseness of these creatures and... Uh, you get a young Paul Sorvino in this, looking all baby-faced and stuff. It's it's really strange to look at him like this. Uh, Edward uh Edward Herman shows up in this movie. The guy uh, whose name I always forget, but he plays the um, like the I forget who he plays. But he's the guy from Real Genius who uh t tells young Mitch, you know, to always uh never forget to check your references. That that guy shows up in this movie as one of the the government stooges that. Steals the dolphins for nefarious. Um, they, they get their revenge, <laughs> obviously. Yeah, but um, there's a part in this movie. Oh, it, it'll make you sad because it's a real Harry and the Hendersons moment to where George C. Scott has to tell the dolphins to scram, or else the government is just gonna come take them again and use them for, you know, their whatever they want to use them for, and. He has to look away and he has to yell. He has to yell at these dolphins. You know, like when 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 George has to slap Harry, tell him to go back in the woods. Yeah, oh, man, that that part then we always look sad every time. But this is a similar moment there because he loved these creatures. He, he had he had to let them go because the government totally sucks. Yes, sir. Can't even have fucking dolphins. Can't even have fucking dolphins. Um, this one you can find on a Kino Classics Blu-ray that came out recently. So if you're interested at all in watching The Day of the Dolphin. I, I highly recommend it because it's a beautiful film. Uh, it's, it's very simplistic. I mean, if you see the poster, you're like, wow, I'm so disappointed these dolphins didn't, like, you know, stick their fins in an assassin or something. No, it's, it's not about that. It's about them being highly trained creatures, very noble and smart creatures, and being exploited by, by, by our government. And George C. Scott doesn't want that. So kudos to that guy. So Day of the Dolphin and The Sadness are recommended. So it's, it's not horrible. It's the, the premise, if you look at the post, I blame the poster. I blame the poster for this. And if I could find it right here, and I think it is right here. Um, <laughs> it's a ridiculous tagline to this movie. And um, yeah... Come on, dang it. Something about, uh, oh my gosh. It's a scientific, th science fiction thriller, which is not, okay, it's crazy, you know. New York Times says, The day the dolphin takes uh, takes off like a blazing forest fire with a thrill a minute. It doesn't do that, but it's still enjoyable, you know. 
Don't be ridiculous reviews. Man, oh man. But I'll, I'll skip that. But you, you basically, the, the poster gives you like this whole schmeal about, oh, did, did I train dolphins to kill the president or something? I mean, it really hams it up. And this is a film that didn't deserve that. And it deserved, you know, what you saw on the screen, which is them showcasing these creatures. And, you know, George C. Scott's love for these creatures, including he rides, there's an underwater scene, which probably isn't even him, probably a stuntman, where he's like in the water with the dolphins. And <laughs> it seems like he might be like dry humping it a little bit. I don't know. I don't want to, I don't want to sully Day of the Dolphin, but you guys should check it out. If anything, George C. Scott talks to dolphins in special languages. So go, uh, Go look for it for that reason. Not only streaming anywhere though, which is um, which is off to me. They they, they should fix that problem. Um, let's see if they'll buy it on iTunes or something. But uh, written by Buck Henry of all people, uh, comedian Buck Henry, and like I said, Mike Nichols directed it. Go so, uh, check out his body of work if you don't know what that is. Da -da 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 -da. That includes The Graduate, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, uh, The Birdcage. Yeah, good, some good stuff in that in that mix. He did some Playhouse '90s too, which those are. Those are like old school, like TV programs. Some of them are on YouTube, so I'd recommend you check those out. Good, good dramas there. Um, Day of Dolphin, though, I, I recommend it. Just like, just like this dude, the saddest, but for whole different sentimental reasons. Um, next thing I want to bring up because I do, I watched something else this week that I, you know, we watch that this these these films willingly, but they have an actress in there or an actor that you'll watch anything they're in, even if it's a giant fucking turd. Well, that's the reason why I watched The Hot Chick. On Amazon Prime, this is a film which Rob Schneider, uh, through ancient uh, uh, Egyptian earrings, switches places with 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 the young Rachel McAdams. Is the first thing she's ever done. Who's like this uh, mean girl in high school, a cheerleader, you know? And um, he, he he has to live life as a man, but he's got the girl brain in him, and it's racially insensitive in parts, and and problematic in parts, and there's gay panic everywhere. But you know who's in this movie that will watch at any movie? Uh, Anna Faris is in this movie. And I always find her charming as hell. And even, uh, on TV show Mom, her and Allison Janney were, were, a, were a perfect pair. And she's not on that show anymore. That show's uh, over with, I believe. Um, I've watched The House Bunny more than once because Anna Faris is in it. I've watched that stinker, I think Scary Movie 3 was where it really started to suck ass for me. But she's in that. But I'll watch it because she's in it. Um, if you know an actress like this and, you know... You watch anything that they're in, and or just let us know on the group page because I, I I had to bring up the hot chick because it's really stupid, but Anna Ferris you know t takes that turn up a notch. I think and she she always does. She, she she's always a winner to me. So <laughs> as an aside there, but uh, yeah, on this show, uh, this very special special show, you you will hear myself, Bo Ransdell, Mister Venom, Suzanne and Iris. Uh, I'll, I'll discuss the movie Best in Show uh, on the next review that you will hear. Uh, sandwiched in there, you will hear myself and Ricky Morton. Rick, Rick, I call him Ricky Morton again. He should be honored by this. I'm calling a member of the Rock and Roll Express. Ricky Morgan. We are going to do Triple Theater once again with um, the amazing Mr. No Legs. And I, I, we'll, we'll get into why we, we, I should say, he should say the amazing Mr. No Legs. He is spectacular. Um, of that with Triple Theater. And to close out the show, I, I'm looking forward to you guys hearing this. Um, we're gonna do a mighty wind, and these these two films, uh, spoilers, are probably my two favorite uh, in the CRISPR guess oeuvre, if you will. The ones I I go back to the most and get the most emotional with. Uh, yeah, so you'll hear that best in show review right to the trailer. Live from Philadelphia, it's the 125th annual Mayflower Kennel Club Dog Show. 3,000 dogs competing for best in show. To think that in some countries these dogs are eaten. Cookie and I work as a team. We met at this dance. He didn't want to dance. I got two left feet. <laughs> I thought he was kidding. But I wasn't. I was born with two left feet. Beatrice has been showing signs of depression. Ever since she saw us having sex, what would you like to say to Beatrice right now? I'm sorry you had to see that. I've been a hairdresser about 14 years. And I uh, went to a show. I asked my ex-wife, who's that? She says, that's Scott. We got top loin, order house, T-bone. We got everything. So basically, you know, meat. <laughs> 
Leslie and I we have an amazing relationship. People say, oh, but he's so much older than you. And you know what? I'm the one having to push him away. <laughs> we both love soup. The bloodhound not only has a great nose, but they can talk. What you doing, bloodhound doggy? What you doing? What you doing? And he's saying, I'm ready. That's when he, you know he's ready for a show. That goal is that best in show ribbon. Actually, oh. poodle means um, puddle in German. You want your busy bee? Come get your busy bee. Cut her out, she doesn't get a door, she's gonna flip out. It's not in here. You left it at the hotel. Go to the hotel and get busy bee. That's my favorite, the miniature schnauzer. Sorry, You'd think it. they'd want to breed them bigger, wouldn't you? Like grapefruits or watermelons. Don't look at the fat head losers or freaks. You look at me. He went after her like she's made out of ham. All right, folks, uh, it's that time again. This is uh, the first review of the night of the CRISPR guest uh, love fest, if you will. Um, people on this this uh, review, uh, I'll start going for, from left to right as I'm reading at the top there. Um, you guys may know him uh, from many, many things. We pick six movies, uh, Duncan and Bo go to Monte Carlo, stuff like that. Um, Mr. Bobranzo, how you doing, sir? Good, good. Uh, fresh, fresh back from Morocco. Man, uh, with Duncan. Do some, um, do some Hope and Crosby shit with you and Duncan. Come on, man, be be amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I like to think that's kind of what that show is anyway. <laughs> it's uh, without the song and dance numbers. Although there's a surprising amount of us singing. But uh, no, I'm, thanks for having me on this. I'm, I'm excited to talk about movie. Like I never get to talk about comedies and uh i'm a big big fan of you know the christopher guest oeuvre you know starting way back in the you know spinal tap days i was you know i was i was a, a young man when i first discovered spinal tap and um there is something i i really love about that kind of brand of really wry you know obviously improvisational kind of comedy of just like we're gonna let an idiot talk into the camera for a minute and funny things are gonna come out of their mouths uh so yeah i it, it's a real treat to talk about this stuff great uh next in line uh iris is here how you doing girl i'm doing well how y'all doing dandy a while. <laughs> dandy dandy excellent eh? and also with us is suzanne how you doing girl hi that's my uh talking about my fat cat and my big dogs but I am doing really, really well, and I absolutely love these movies. I, he surrounded himself with some of the best actors, so I'm, it's just fun to talk about these. And finally, last but certainly not, certainly not least, um, from many, many things you'll hear in your ears, because uh, he's a podcasting horror, much like myself, you know. Mr. Venom's here. How you doing, sir? Greetings and salutations, Gestovians. And yes, I have coined that term because... There is not an all-encompassing term for Christopher Guest fans. So if you are a Christopher Guest fan, you are a Guestovian, and you are one of my people. Good on you. I like it. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to start using it uh, as of this recording. Very cool. <laughs> make, make that stick, y'all. Uh, today, tonight, we're going to talk about Best in Show from the year 2000. Um, a, lot, a lot of the same cast you've seen in these other films, but... um. This is a, a film in which Christopher Guest and his cast of Zany characters um, apparently made a dog show from the ground up because they couldn't use a real one. And, uh, yeah, these people are all obsessed with their dogs. And this this this, this show, the the, the Mayflower uh, Kennel Show, uh, or whatever it's called, whatever it's called, but this is Mayflower for sure. And um, they've all come together to uh, show their dogs off and show how crazy they are as dog people and... I will kick cast right now. Eugene Levy is back, and so is Catherine O'Hara as Jerry and Cookie Fleck. Uh, John Michael John Michael Higgins uh, makes his debut in these films as uh, Scott Do this is Scott Domlin. I'm sorry. Uh, Michael McKeon's back as Stefan Vanderhoof, his his partner with the Shih Tzus. Uh, Michael Hitchcock is back again as Hamilton Swan. Parker Posey is back as Meg Swan with the braces. We'll talk about that, I'm sure. Oh my gosh. Uh, Jennifer Coolidge uh, is, makes her debut as Sherry Ann Cabot. Jane Lynch makes her debut as Christy Cummings. A lot of debuts. It's pretty cool. 
Uh, Chris Bergast is back again, of course, acting in his own movies as Harlan Pepper, the owner of The Hound, uh, and the master of nuts, apparently. Larry Miller's back, being fucking hilarious in this movie as well. Uh, Fred Willard, Ed Bagley Jr. shows up in this movie. Oh, Bob Balaban is back again. Oh, I, I, I have so much love for this film. But probably, you know, more than any other one. So I'm going to kick it to Bo first and, and ask him, uh, what do you think about this film, sir? Oh, I love this movie. In fact, it hasn't been that long ago that I watched it. I do a, a movie night eh, about once every month six weeks something like that at the house and like make a big dinner uh for some friends of mine and i and we watch a movie uh usually downstairs i've got like a big 100 inch screen and projector and that kind of thing so like i would really do it up and it was within the last six months that we did best in show uh and i just adore it i think it's incredibly funny um there the moment you see like the Eugene Levy high school picture, which happens fairly early on, but when he's talking about how he used to be a little bit of a Casanova himself and they show that picture and it is the most like off-putting, hilarious picture of any human being ever. I, I lose my shit. It is, it is one of my favorite like visual jokes ever. Um, yeah. They, I mean, it's just one of those movies that every time you watch it, there's some other little nook and cranny of it that will sort of tickle your funny bone, uh, which is, uh, I, I think, a phrase first used by Lawrence Welk. But there, yeah, it's just wonderful. Like, it, it's just, it's crammed with little subtle jokes. And this time around, watching it the other day in preparation for this, I think it was because he passed away not so long ago, but just watching Larry Miller talking about t working as, um, you know, a, a hostage negotiator or a crisis uh, counselor and saying, oh, that's that's the thing. They all jump, you know, <laughs> like, it's it's just hysterical. It, it's maybe my favorite, like accepting Spinal Tap, which I have a real soft spot for. But in terms of, uh, you know, the Gestovian <laughs> set of films <laughs> that I think this is my favorite favorite be because i partly it's because i relate to it because i'm you know i i love dogs and i i don't go quite as far as although i would probably say i was in the harlan pepper range of dog ownership um but i i don't go so far as uh as some of the others but it like it, i like the fact that the movie also never punches down at these characters like it has a lot of affection for these people even as they're doing ridiculous things that it seems like christopher guest as the director as well as the actors who are kind of inhabiting these characters that they all have as, as silly as everything is there's still a lot of affection and joy and that kind of thing and i think it's hard to walk away from this movie, like feeling bad about people they're they're incredibly silly people, but they're also kind of wonderful and lovable i like the bookend of you know parker posey and her husband at the therapist and you know just what this therapist must be thinking of just like these stupid fucking that i am absolutely taken for a ride but even with that sorry i'll shut up about it in a second but even even with that therapy stuff like even that it, you kind of understand like oh they're not really talking about the dog they're talking about themselves and their relationship and you know that this movie is actually you know kind of getting at some stuff about about the way that people use their dogs as surrogates for their own emotion and their own feelings and like it all all comes down to fred willard being like now do these dogs have any idea what's going on around them and of course not you know that this is all for the people who own the dogs and uh it's it's terrific man this movie is, is the absolute best i love this movie i forget what i was watching but there was a comment somebody made about the you know, that dog's not wearing the sweater because he likes it he's doing it to please you or something like that he says yeah <laughs> right yeah and 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 the, like his partner uh fred willard's you know the color com he's doing the color and the other guy's kind of the expert but the other guy having to kind of like well they know that they're special dogs i guess you know that it's just all this equivocation about you know th this is of course it's purely for the owners these dogs couldn't give a shit less as long as they're getting you know food and pets they don't care so it's wonderful you know because that, that that head got caught in the gargoyle's mouth and it popped off like a grape you know 
That reminds me <laughs> of, do you remember when we were at the lake? And, oh, God. I mean, dude, Eugene Levy trying to, uh, trying to get back at Larry Miller by saying, how about I just tell, talk about your wife? And she's got big, luscious melon breasts. And her reaction being like, thank you. <laughs> yeah. It's just the best. Like I said, everywhere you look at this movie, somebody is doing something. Oh, my gosh. Uh, Suzanne. Oh, God. <laughs> this is one of those movies that I end up going back to every few months. Just if I need, you know, basically it, it, it's comfort food for my brain. I, it, Bo nailed it. I mean, there's so many, even after numerous viewings, there's still like little things that always pop out. And I think, I, I, I love every character here, but Parker Posey does some of my favorite things. In the and the psychiatrist's office with Beatrice, the, that poor dog, I really feel bad for the dog because she is owned by two insane people. And well, we got this book. And it's just the tone that she uses when she's telling this little story to their dog, Shrank. And Catherine O'Hara is just hilarious as Cookie. And I mean, I remember the first time I saw it and everyone's like, Cookie Guggenheimer? Is that you? I don't bang that many waitresses. I bang a lot of waitresses, but you were the best. And it just, it's just that continuous joke throughout the movie that just always makes me laugh in her. She would have won the Ministry of Silly Walks when she hurt her knee when they were showing Winky. And I, I just, you know, packing seven seven to ten kimonos for a two-day trip, that was... I packed ten pairs of shoes for four days, and I wore one pair. I, I understand the whole had to bring all of the kimonos. You just never know. Everybody in this movie was absolutely outstanding at what they bring to the table there is so much talent it's just overflowing in this movie and everybody gets their moment to shine it doesn't spend too much time on any character but everybody has their moments and i think jane lynch and jennifer coolidge are just funny and just she just jennifer coolidge with that whole well, they came in and took this poor little kennel and she's like, it's a shit box and brought it up to the state of the art facility. And, you know, Rhapsody has two mommies. I think the first time I saw this movie, I spit something all the way across the room when that happened. It was way too funny. And, you know, well, her and her husband, they do, they can talk or not talk all night. And they both love soup. Yeah, I was going to say, not to interrupt you, but when she says, we have a lot in common, I mean, we both love soup. It <laughs> just devastates me. Yeah. Oh, I know. Just, we could talk and not talk all night. Yeah. I kind of got we, we both love snow peas. <laughs> but there's so many wonderful elements to this. And I, I swear to God, I sometimes think I, I side more with the dogs, except Harlan Pepper dog and winky those two those two dogs made they have got and oh yes vanderhoof and oh god i can't remember his name now scott doing calendars of iconic scenes from movies of the 40s and 50s it's just everybody they really took on these personas and brought the whole thing to life in a way there's very few filmmakers what we are custodians that very few filmmakers ever possibly could and i like the fact that he keeps it his cast fairly i mean just once again brimming with talent but it, it's he keeps everything on a manageable level but i just can't even say how much thank you mel how much i, I love this movie cool uh venom next all right man what can i say about this movie that hasn't been said this movie is near flawless um there is not a bad performance in this film christopher guest really knows how to pick his actors you know um incredibly funny people but just the fact that they can ad lib you know three quarters of a film is just spectacular um i myself for those who don't know i probably mentioned it on the last christopher guest show but i'm married to a veterinarian uh, have been for we just celebrated our 26th anniversary 
Congratulations. And thank you. Thank you. Um, so I love dogs. I mean, that's a given. I love animals in general. Um, and this movie just really speaks to me. Um, I've actually been to a dog show in Pittsburgh with my wife, like a, a much smaller one, honestly. Nothing Westminster or Cruft's size, but um, just a great experience. And, you know, when I was talking about this movie on the last episode about these Christopher Guest movies and how they speak to me and how maybe Waiting for Guffman didn't speak to me as loudly as something like a Best in Show or a Mighty Wind and definitely not Spinal Tap as, you know, I am a big old metalhead. Um, it just kind of speaks to just the brilliance of um, Eugene and Christopher and, you know, how they're able to put this movie together and the, the people in this film, my God, it just just star after star after star with and the fact that he can bring in top name comedians to do like one line is just so epic i mean will sasso who yeah will sasso is not an a-list actor by any stretch but in the late 90s he was a big name because of his work in film and television to come in and do basically two lines and one of them being just one of the funniest goddamn deliveries in this film um it just so much quality in this film to speak of and and then the, the piece de resistance, the cherry on top of my spectacular comedy Sunday, Fred goddamn Willard is, I, I'm sorry, Fred Willard is a goddamn treasure. He makes this movie, at least the dog show part of this film, so incredibly entertaining. Who else can do color commentary at a dog show and bring up countries that eat dogs and be completely oblivious to it and get away with it? I, I, I'm sorry. Just, it, it is stellar. May that man hold a high seat in Valhalla because he fucking deserves it. Um, but I mean, like I said, what else can be said about this film? Bob Balaban, potentially one of the best straight men in history, in film history. I mean, the fact that he's not even trying to be funny and somehow he tickles me in every scene he's in, just, uh, it just speaks to the comedic genius that's just oozing off of this film from, you know, so many sources, writing, directing, performances, even the songs. Oh my God, the songs. God loves a terrier? Come on now. I would imagine God loves all dogs, but still <laughs> to have to hear that song about God loving one species of dog, just, or one breed of dog, excuse me, um, just absolutely stellar. The songs that Cookie um, and her husband sing at the end too, when they're recording the album, just... Oh my God, so great. And, you know, unlike, um, excuse me, unlike the Cabots in this movie, my wife and I actually do run out of things to not talk about. So it does turn into a little bit of a problem in our marriage, but it's okay. Someday we'll have that ability to not talk about all sorts of topics. And that's when I'll know we've made it as a married couple. But yeah, I, I, this movie, my God, uh, just an absolute 10 out of 10. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm, it's a spoiler. Sorry. But uh, just, I adore this film. I honestly, as I've said on the last episode, I, I love Christopher Guest. Anything he's done, I will happily consume. And this run of movies from Waiting for Guffman to um, For Your Consideration, just, oh my God, some of, the, some of the most stellar comedic films, uh, you know, put together in a row from a writer-director. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, just a stellar film that I will never, ever get sick of. I just watched it last night and <laughs> big surprise, watched it for probably the 50th time, still ended the night with a stomach ache. I was laughing so goddamn hard. So yeah, spectacular. Iris. Uh, just to jump in on Sorry. what you said about Fred Willard, when she's judging and she goes, the, the female judge she goes up and like cups one of the dog's balls. And he's like, oh God, I wouldn't want to go on a date with her. I'd be afraid of how she judged me. <laughs> when, when he's interviewing, speaking of Bob Balaban, when he's interviewing Bob Balaban and is talking to him about like the Mayflower landing in the West Indies. <laughs> Like, well, I, I, I don't think that's right. Yeah, well, we'll leave that to the editors. They'll clean that up in the in the office. But, oh, my God. He, like, as soon as this movie starts to lull even the slightest bit, Fred Willard shows up and just hits the booster rockets mm -hmm. and makes the back end of this even funnier than the front. 100%. Mel, don't you? Do Iris. Well, for me, this is uh, my favorite of the guest movies. Um, it's a barrel of laughs. <laughs> um just Catherine O'Hara and Eugene Eugene Levy when <laughs> the card the fucking credit card <laughs> <laughs> that's the good one yeah, it is, is right 
Wait, wait, like two notices. You, you tell them it's two notices. And well, he says it's been two notices. <laughs> and then they start pulling cash out. It's like $34. <laughs> I mean, like, but then again, I mean, the dude is so nice by just taking them and going, well, you know, we can bring a cot in here and you can spend the night and which is basically the room that he already gave you a tour of where all the cleaning stuff is because they know they're going to have dogs, which is another great bit because you have the nature's miracle bottle for the smaller dogs. And then, you know, this huge lemon X for, you know, the great Danes and then the nuclear power that, that, that whole bit right there is hilarious. And of course, when uh, Parker Posey is, (laughs) I think Venom and I talked about this last time. Um, <laughs> she starts accusing the maid of taking the toy. <laughs> I'm gonna bring INS. Blah blah blah. <laughs> oh gosh, she was oh, a Karen God. before the term was coined. Right, right. <laughs> it was great. I, it's not a bee. That's a parrot. Right. <laughs> it's just. Oh my gosh, it's just so so funny. And um, of course, you know, uh, how can you not love? Uh, Scott and um, Vanderhoof, you know, it, it's they play off of each other so fucking well. And the way he carries himself, and he's he reminds me of that inappropriate twink that a bear would have, is basically <laughs> it, you know, having to rein them in a little bit, like, haha, you're funny, yeah, you're cute, you just calm down a little bit. But it's just, just fucking hilarious, just the things he says, like. The, the poor butcher guy. <laughs> in other like, words, me. <laughs> but he's like, well, why don't you pull out a pepperoni stick? <laughs> I just want to hold it. <laughs> <laughs> and this poor guy started him like, wait, what? Are you like? <laughs> oh my God. And just all of his comments are just beautiful and lovely. And you know, I agree with, agree with Suzanne. Um, Cookie Fleck, when she busts her her ankle or knee or whatever, <laughs> the way she's fucking walking when, when when they've already won and she's trying to get to her husband. <laughs> oh my god! Oh shit! I I was uh, oh my god! I was cracking up. I'm sitting in the office and I'm cracking up, and I know Lynn can hear me, and she's probably thinking, "What the fuck is she watching in there?" But yeah, and and you know what? I've had her sit down and watch this movie with me. And yeah, she kind of just stares at me sometimes when I'm laughing at some shit because, or even before stuff happens, you know, because Venom, I'm sure, you know, you know, something funny is coming and you already, you're, you're laughing already because you're already thinking of it. <laughs> like uh, Sasso, when he's, when he's talking to them and he's like, so are you going to stop and fish? And he's like, uh, no, I, we're not fishing. His character is so funny. And Sasso is on the screen mm. for like, what, maybe three or four minutes. And this guy is hilarious. Um, he used to play on something on a show here in Seattle. Uh, it was kind of like uh, Saturday Night Live. But- the Mad, T- oh, Mad, Mad TV. TV. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, even before Mad TV. It was just here based in Seattle itself. And um, Bill Nye, the science guy, was also on it. But and it's it's like an old show. And I this guy used to correct me all the fucking time. And even on Matt TV, he was hilarious. But yeah, this whole movie in itself, I just love how tongue in cheek it is, even though, you know, it's kind of like Willard is asking those questions that, you know, you kind of have when you are watching a dog show, because I like to watch dog shows. And I, I do have those questions like, well, you know, why do they do this? Or why do they tuck them here? Or why do they pull them there? Or why do they pick them up by their tail and, 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 and throw it's, you know, it just, it was just funny to watch because it's kind of like, here's this guy, Fred Willard, who is, you know, just dude off the street. And he's paired up with Pepper, who is, obviously a British very well you know very proper type of guy (laughs) kudos to him about not breaking well from what we saw what's been edited um he did not crack up every time Willard opened his mouth man because 
I do every time. And so it's, it's hilarious. It's funny. It's really out there, but it kind of like, it's also feels homey. Like these are people that you either have in your circle of friends or coworkers. So that, I think that's why it's just so intriguing, but yeah, that's, that's my two cents. No, this, this film is filled with a lot of little things. Like you guys mentioned the part <laughs> where they're at the, the party and um, Harlan is talking to the um, two, two Parker Posey and her husband about flies and they can give a fuck about fishing whatsoever. So they just look at you're going to fall asleep standing there. I, he just keeps going. I, I, I had to break the tension by asking him what he was wearing. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what was, is that J crew? Let me, let me look. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Oh, so well, J crew is their kind of their, their thing. An yeah, entire relationship people. based on catalogs. My God. I, I love that whole scene where they were talking about the first time they saw each other. And you can see in that scene that they're, they're just totally like playing tennis of like, Oh, remember that we were in the Starbucks and it's, it's just watching them. Yes. And each other through that scene until they get to, and then we would just go in, into the Starbucks and we would look at the catalog and I would ask you what's new. Like, and, and you would pick out the things that oh, were new in that, that edition of the catalog. And you can tell that this is just them completely improving all of it. And, and uh, you know, like you were saying, it, the fact that they don't lose their shit is a skill unto itself. You know, it's one thing to invent that stuff. It's another thing entirely to not, not lose your focus and just crack up. And, and another, you know, uh, the, the one thing that's interesting because you have a gay couple and kind of a lesbian couple, even though it doesn't begin that way, but it's kind of, you know, clear that Jane Lynch is into her and it, for it being a movie in the year 2000, like, yes, yeah, Scott's kind of, you know, like Iris said, like this ridiculous tweet character, but it doesn't treat those relationships any differently than any other relationship in the movie. And it's weird not weird, but I mean, it's just kind of nice to see that the movie doesn't have a stance on that. It's not, there was nothing political about it, I suppose. It's just kind of like for a movie that is 20 years old, it's strangely progressive in the way that it treats gay and lesbian care of just like, oh yeah, that's just, yeah, it's who they are. It's no big you know, it, And vice versa too, you know, because at the same, the same party scene, you know, Jerry meets our, our gay couple and they're just in love with this fucking square, this white bread square that they met. And, you know, he's getting right in the mix with them. He's describing, <laughs> again, so much little shit, the, the, the red stitching he did himself on those pants, you know, and uh, it's just, it's, 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 it's what crazy. What's here is like, who did that? You did? <laughs> it's, oh, it, it, uh, watching this again, it was one of those, because uh, I, I don't think I'd watched it since I watched all of Shit's Creek. Creek. And it was fun to see, uh, like, oh, yeah, they're playing in completely different characters together. It's like they, they've been doing this for so long. They're, you know, it's no wonder that's as good as it is. It's not a, you know, Gestovian film, but it is certainly in the ballpark. Because Cookie uh, had dozens of boyfriends, hundreds, h hundreds of boyfriends. Sure. You know? At once? Right. <laughs> and she's so deadpan when she says it. Hundreds. Oh. Every time it happens, though, like... It, and I think it's it's at the the par same party scene, to where she, he met another one of Cookie's ex boyfriends, and he just has that that head tilt down, like he's so crestfallen, like another one, another one, seriously, you know, and a, a guy who, married. yeah, a guy who uh, on the way to the dog show was gonna stop at the Philadelphia Cream Cheese Factory just to go visit it. He, he's he's that white bread. He's he's gonna do that, and you know, um. Oh man, it, it's funny standing here and listening to us talk about this really speaks to the brilliance of the ad libs here because I don't know if anybody's noticed, but we've spent half this review just quoting the movie. Oh. I've never done that as a podcaster and I am having an absolute blast. It's hard not to, it's hard not to, exactly. you know, it's hard not to. Comedy gold, my friend. Now between this and Spinal Tap, I swear I've had conversations in this language. <laughs> I mean, the, the little, little, again, you guys mentioned Will Sasso, when he's they're still driving away and he's still convincing to go fishing, he's, he's 
gawking at the dog saying, who's going to catch a big fish? Who's going to catch a big fish? I, and it's just, <laughs> he plays these characters and I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll endorse this film, but not as good as a good film. But if you haven't seen that Three Stooges film just for their performances, I, I think you should do yourself a favor because Will, Will Sasso is curly in that movie and it's kind of wonderful. Um, I can... I, I can make uh, a couple of friends of mine laugh just by saying peanut nut. Yeah. It, uh, so can, can we, Oh, I sorry. Sorry about go ahead and finish. No, no, no. I was just going to name another nut. That's all. <laughs> He's driving Mac his mama Damian crazy. Nut. What pistachio nut? <laughs> a macadamia oh, nut. Uh, <laughs> That's so the good. I mean, we're crazy. Uh, Ultimately, Harlan Pepper is an expert on hounds, fly fishing, and nuts. And really, what else is there? And, and ventriloquy. Oh, yeah. I guess. Well, oh, that's, yeah. a, that's a new talent, that. though. He's yeah. developing that one. Show the lady. Yeah, so can we Show talk lady. about how beautiful the relationship between the actors and the dogs were? Absolutely, yeah. But because in a way, you know, at first I thought, um, are these actual their dogs? But they're not. They are actual Canadian champions. Um, they belong to other people. And, of course, the judges, some of the judges uh, were actual judges there. Um, of course, except for the very last judge. Uh, mm-hmm. And it, it's kind of interesting to see that relationship they had with the dogs. It's, it's almost like that dog belonged to them. And I, it always amazes me every time i see and watch this movie especially the shih tzus and wink it's almost like they're bonded and i'm sure at the end of the filming of this that the actors had a hard time saying goodbye to those dogs because it it, it just looked like the relationship that they they had a true relationship with that dog and and i kind of wonder if they kind of like maybe borrowed the dog for a while and had the you know had the actors and the dogs kind of like live together and stuff so they could develop that bond but Possibly. i don't know i thought th- i think it's always amazing to watch well, i feel bad for the, the dog dogs... oh, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry uh no just I'll, it's very quick but i think the way that they paired the dogs with the actors yeah that's because, another thing i mean you could not i mean with it, Parky, Parker Posey and her husband, they have got the most neurotic dog. <laughs> yes. I mean, I, I feel bad for Beatrice. I, I, I couldn't live <laughs> in that house either. Oh my God, right. And then and, there's a down to earth wink that he's yeah. so cute. And then the, oh, well, any Hubert is like the, his buddy. I mean, that is seriously, this is a pair. These are two mm-hmm. buddies. They go fishing, they go hunting, they go for walks, they go. It's a companion. Right, it's a down-to-earth dog, just like he is. And then, of course, you've got the flamboyant shih tzus. Oh, I know. And the and, flamboyant and, couple. <laughs> and they, those dogs are just as flamboyant as they are. And exactly. It's, it's, and then they, the fancy-schmancy poodle. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right? Standard poodle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it always amazed me how well these dogs were paired up with the actors and, and just how how it looks like it was you know it was like actually their dog so and you know kudos to the actors too because they had to be trained on how to handle these dogs so you know i a lot went into this movie and you could really tell that you know these folks that were in this movie these actors everybody just really put a lot of heart in this and it's just such a amazing little movie that you know just makes you laugh crack up you kind of get emotionally invested in some of the cre- the, with some of the creatures. Well, yeah, some of the dogs and also with uh, some of the characters in here. Well, I just think it was random, stupid thing that I always found kind of, it's, like I said, completely random, completely stupid. But when they were at the dog show and they were talking about the different breeds, they managed to slide Borzoi in because they must, somebody must have had fun saying Borzoi because they well, kept talking about the Borzoi. Right, right. And well, didn't somebody mention, oh, I think it was Scott who was saying that when he met uh, Vanderhoof uh, that, or, or Stefan, that I, yeah. like Scott's dog was doing I something to a board <laughs> Oh, boy. <clears throat> yeah, I love, I love this film quite a bit. I haven't said a whole lot about it, but a lot of folks said a lot about it, and that, that, that's fine. But um, 
I, I can relate to, to to Jerry Flex so much. Not his trophy husband, you know, but I've, I've known guys like him, and I, I'm pretty milquetoast myself, pretty simple myself, you know. I'm kind of a, a cross between him and, and Harlan, I would say. Um, if I had, had, had another dog, though, it, it would be that Norwich Terrier. I, I always like small dogs, and I don't know if you know this or not, but when uh, Darla, who's, uh, you know, I'm going to start crying now. <laughs> I can't do that, though. Um, no, don't cry, because I'm going to cry. I know. But when I first got her groomed, you know, because she was a big old floof ball mess, I said, I'm going to hold this dog up by Jerry Fleck at the end of this movie. And, and I did. And uh, <laughs> I was so happy to do that, you know. It's just, oh, so cool. oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I like when Fred Willard describes the sports dogs as the jocks of yeah. the dog world. <laughs> Even, I mean, even Fred Willard's um, non sequiturs just work so well. In the middle of commentating on a dog show, he turns to his partner and says, hey, want to guess how much I can bench? <laughs> right. What? Right. What does that have to do with anything? And you're saying this on live television. Wow. Go, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Just just take a wild guess. 358. Five, <laughs> and 500 ta- 510 pound deadlift. Dead. Oh, so good. Uh, yeah, it, it. I mean, it. And you know, like we were talking about with the the dogs kind of being the reflection of their owners and kind of looking like them in a lot of ways. Uh, it really is a nice comment about like the role that dogs play in our lives. And if you know, if I mean, I, I think most of us here are dog owners. And if you've got a dog or had a dog, you know, um, then. It's it, like it. It's just one of those things that like you you will do crazy shit for your dog, and the dog doesn't know it. Like I sing no less than two different kinds of songs to my dog when I'm feeding him. Couldn't care less. <laughs> like that dog doesn't care. But I'm like appropriating songs from the musical The Producers as. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I will definitely sing It's Treat Time for Johnson in Germany in a heartbeat. <laughs> and, and you know, it means nothing to him, but it brings me a lot of joy. And I think that's kind of the, the thing about this movie is, you know, the, like for Harlan to put his dog in the, in, his, in the pickup truck and drive him to this show. Um, it's, you know, it, it like there is something kind of wonderful about that idea of like, yeah, I would love to just get in the car and just drive around with my dog at a place where a bunch of other cool dogs are going to be. That sounds like a great time. And, and I think it's yes, one it of the, it, it's one of the reasons I think this movie works so well is that as the viewer, even as ridiculous as the characters are, there is something that you can like relatable in those characters. And also there's a little bit of wish fulfillment too, that yeah, it's all nonsense, but you know, I mean, if you got to do something with your life <laughs> and, and, you know, treating your dog uh, like over well is not the worst choice you can make. Yeah, this movie also has, in my opinion, some of the strongest post-event scenes in a Christopher Guest movie, or the what are they doing now, if you will. I brought it up during Waiting for Guffman because I I talked about how some of the what are they doing now scenes in Waiting for Guffman are a little sad, especially like Parker Posey and um, a Christopher Guest character. This one, ah, so funny and triumphant. I mean, even the people that lost still found a way to get a win out of this. You know, one couple starts a magazine, another couple shoots a calendar, um, another couple, well, the winning couple records an album, you know? So just, it it leaves you with such a good feeling, uh, this movie. Whereas Waiting for Guffman leaves me a little sad sometimes when I walk away from it. This one, no, ear to ear grin as I'm walking away from this film, knowing that, Everybody, including the shitty swans, even they are in a better situation at the end of the movie. You know, they've got themselves a new dog who apparently doesn't mind watching them have sex. So, you know, <laughs> oh, he really likes to it. watch. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So. And humping the doctor. Yeah, <laughs> so, oh, you know. How else would you end a Christopher Guest movie than having a dog <laughs> hump a psychiatrist? Come on. There you go. <laughs> so, have we talked about how the manager of the hotel mentioned? The rock band yeah. hosting a goat. Yeah. It's a universe. It's a multiverse. <laughs> it, is, it, is, it is. It is. It is. The fact that he refers to it as the the smell of roasted goat and cumin. And cumin. Yeah. <laughs> 
human is what what sells me on that joke the most. Oh, so good. <laughs> well, apparently their drummer got reincarnated as a hotel manager. Oh, that's right. Yeah, he was one of their original drummers. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, eagle-eyed fans, um, you will remember that the Taft Hotel is where Spinal Tap stayed when they stopped in Philadelphia uh, during their film. And uh, Oh my God. Oh, what a beautiful, beautiful connection. Oh, I love it. <laughs> so now we have the, the Gastopian. There you go. The, the Gastopian, Gastopian universe. <laughs> the Gastopian yep. I like it. Oh, man. <laughs> Except that, that, you know people play like five different characters in the, in the guest ver- guest diverse so yeah that could get confusing who is <laughs> Catherine o'hare in the guest diverse hmm. uh, dr strange in the guest diverse of madness there you go, there you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah, i just saw a commercial for that <laughs> Does oh it look good i don't watch trailers <laughs> well i'm I assume... part of it there's lots and lots of flashy lights and benedict cumberbatch and that's pretty much as all i got out of it because oh, so it's a marvel movie there you go. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> eh, Sam Raimi's doing it, though. I'm going to give it to Dan Gord. Oh, that's in there. true. Yeah, but he did Aquaman. Oh, oh, no, no. My bad. I'm yeah. thinking of the, the Aquaman. <laughs> yeah. No, he did Spider-Man 2, and Spider-Man 2 rules. That movie oh, Spider-Man awesome. 2 is still one of the best superhero movies. Ever. Oh, for sure. By far. Oh, Alfred Molina. Oscar worth. <laughs> yeah. Still good in No Way Home, as it turns out. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> But, uh, and then the last thing I, I can say about uh, this movie is just the fact that we've got a little bit of Twin Peaks cred in here, too. Anyone who knows me might know Twin Peaks is my favorite TV show of all time. And to see Major Briggs be the judge in the best in show category, just it tickles me, even though he has like all of four words, not even whole lines, just a few words here and there it, it, for whatever it's worth. It, it, it makes me happy. So yeah, I felt yeah, I felt the same way. I was like, oh, they need to have like the picture of his face floating, yes, you know, wavily over, or show the log lady in the audience somewhere, whatever. Yeah, <laughs> my log likes that dog. <laughs> I'll kick it to kick it back to Bo. Um, anything else like to say? And what do you give it one to ten? Oh man, um, I I think this is a solid nine out of ten for me. Uh, I it, it's hard to find fault with it uh in in the grand scheme of things you know there there are little moments here and there that i feel like oh well this is just a thread that kind of goes nowhere but that's kind of the nature of these improvisational movies um but that said like i find it ridiculously funny i think it's it's strangely um i love you know uh meg and uh what is what is her husband's name parker poser my yeah they're they're matching outfits <laughs> and the fact that even at the end of the movie when they're dressed strangely not unlike the parrot toy um <laughs> it's got the same kind of color scheme but yes. they're, they color coordinate with one another um i think is a really funny bit and the fact that they both have braces and everything like that couple is such a disaster of a couple but i can't get enough of it i would watch an entire movie just about their day-to-day mm-hmm. life um but yeah it's it it's it's really funny it's really sweet it it is outside of spinal tap it is absolutely my favorite in the guest of earth and uh (laughs) i i I cannot i i cannot say enough great things about like if if someone is listening to this has never seen best in show it's it doesn't like it's not bombastic or anything it doesn't go for gut laughs it just consistently really, really funny. And it's anchored by some of the best comedians that have ever worked. And is seeing them all together in this particular film is just a joy, especially because some of them are gone now. And and seeing this movie, it's like, man, what a what a wonderful testament. The work that they did. It's so good. Iris. Sorry, I was muted. Um uh yeah, no, for me, this is I mean, this is me. This is the most favorite guest movie. Uh, for me and I mean I could sit and watch this uh, even twice a day I think and I would still crack up laughing and and it's not just (laughs) that's funny no I was literally laughing out loud while I was watching this movie and every time I will do it and like I was saying before you know I know that certain scenes are coming and I will start giggling even before the gag happens. So yeah, this movie's a six. I, I mean, a 10 out of 10 for me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I forgot what show I was on. <laughs> Venom. Um, man, 
absolutely love this movie. Uh, this is a movie that I could probably never watch with someone who's never seen it before because as Iris said I would just start laughing before the gags even started and then the person with me would end up missing half the movie because of my loud ass laughter so yeah um what a testament to this thing the fact that I, I just watched this last night as I said again for the hundredth time and I you know the, the, it's still gets me every time every joke is on point even the ones that maybe fall a little bit flat you still let out a tiny little chuckle because deep down inside you know this is ridiculous and it's very very funny um as i mentioned probably the best post event or what are they doing now scenes of the series whether i can call this my favorite or not is a tough one um on the last episode when we did waiting for guffman i said a mighty wind is my favorite the thing is is that with those two movies a mighty wind and best in show my favorite is just whatever the one i most recently saw is because they just they, they entertain me to no end um so I'll have to watch A Mighty Win like really, really soon just to really lock down finally which one is my favorite. But I mean, it's definitely between those two. Um, I am a musician. So anything they do involving music like Spinal Tap and um, A Mighty Wind is going to speak to me. Uh, obviously, you know, the love of animals and being married to a vet. Uh, dog, uh, you know, Best in Show is going to speak to me. My love of uh, film and television. So, um, you know, the one of the last ones they did, I think it was called For Your Consideration. Uh, another one that I really like so for me i actually said 10 out of 10 earlier i'm gonna amend that just a little bit and i'm gonna come in with a 9.5 only because parker posey was being racist to that hotel employee <laughs> who's left well, suzanne oh i love this movie and i i agree i between this and a mighty wind it is usually the one that i've seen most recently that is my favorite but the two movies are just perfect but this one there just there are so many little strings throughout the movie that you don't realize are there, and it's the the characters. And yes, I sing silly songs to my dogs all the time. I come up with ridiculously stupid nicknames for both of them. Right now, I was really tired. I wasn't sure who I was yelling at. I've got Naya and Nara, and it came out Naira. <laughs> so now, when I don't know who I'm yelling at, I just call Naira. So one of them knows they're in trouble. But the way that he interacts, it's, oh, uh, this movie is just, it's, it, it's, it's damn near perfect. And it's, it, you're right. It's not straight up belly laughs throughout the entire movie. It's, it's subtle humor, but after you've seen it a few times, you know what's coming. And I would, I, I would be the same way. I just start laughing because I know what's going to happen. And side note on Will Sasso, he was in a movie, I think it was called I want to say Drop Dead Gorgeous with Denise yes. Richards. And oh, once again, terrific just, movie. Yeah. Love it. A, he only had a few lines, but he's literally the same guy, but in Drop Dead Gorgeous, he's just a little more perverted. <laughs> <laughs> but I just, I do, I adore this movie. And I'll quit talking now. I'm, I honestly, I can't go any lower than a 10. It's, there's just too much here to love. And there's, I can't say a, I can't say that there's anything in there that makes me look down upon it at all. So it's going to get my, my rare 10 out of 10. Um, yeah, I got to mention, you know, how, how good our newcomers are in this movie. Because, you know, Jane Lynch, who's not not unknown at this point, I don't think. Or she's pretty unknown. She hasn't done much since then. But she, she saw Waiting for Guffman. That's what made her want to be in this movie. And John Michael Higgins um, is under underutilized as a comedian, I think. Because... He's in this. He shows up in a mighty wind, which I think he's better in, because he he shows his prowess as a musician and and a singer in that movie too, and um, just thought he utilizes an actor. I I, I love him in everything I've ever seen him in. I'm, I'm a sucker for Fred Claus with with Vince Vaughn and Paul Giamatti. He's in that movie. Um, just uh, great, and it, it's a great film all around. If you're a dog person at all, you're going to love this movie. If you love anything that we, we've said on this episode, you're going to love this movie. I enjoy it every time I fucking watch it, every minute of it. So I, I, I got to give it a 10 out of 10. I, I love it that much. So, yeah. You know, speaking of pet names, uh, one of my favorite things to do is to give overly elaborate names to, to my pets. You know, oh, like God. Bull. And uh, so... When I got J Johnson was a rescue, the the dog I've got now, 
and which always sounded very formal to me. Um, although I think it's because he's got kind of a big dick. I think that's why he was saying that. <laughs> <laughs> she does. It's kind of distracting. But uh, but uh, so the na- the overly elaborate name I've given him is Johnson Presbyterian Barkington the third. <laughs> and that, and, and so that's how I signed his name and stuff at doctor, like, you know, the vet offices and so forth. <laughs> and oh, so ever, too, yeah. and every now and again, I'll you know you'll get the notice of like, oh, it's time for Johnson Presbyterian Barkington the, the third's <laughs> new round of anti worm medicine, and it hey. oh, it delights me to no end. Well, oh. it, it's it's you know no more exotic than Excel's Desi does it with pizzazz, which was Rhapsody in White. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's so good. Oh, so my good. Naya, my oldest, is Naya Lathotep Sheldon Cooper Capaletti because you know love rap and from the time she was a puppy, if if one of the cats, if one of us were in her spot, she would sit there and start barking. Oh, she'll let you know. So that's how the Sheldon Cooper got attached to it. And Nara, I had a great name picked up, but Pat's like, no, I want them to match. So we have Nara instead of something really cool. So, of course, I named her Black Nara Naya Lavatep, which is always fun, too. How do you pronounce that? Nara. My one cat that I had before we, we lost, unfortunately, in the fire was uh, named Major Mittens Thunder Pussy McGillicuddy. Very nice. That was, that was, <laughs> that was her whole name. And Duchess's whole name is Duchess Furiosa O'Shaughnessy. So that's, that's, uh, I, I like to give them the library names too. I didn't name Darla, but, um, she was just Darla. And, uh, that was my friend. I missed that. God damn, I, I gotta stop doing this, but, um, I know. I'm gonna end this now. Just put it that way. Uh, thank you all for being on here, and, uh, we'll be right back with something else. Now here's something we hope you'll really like. You are about to see scenes from an unusual film about an amazing man. And we really can't blame Andy for not wanting to take a leave of absence, can we, sir? Well, under the circumstances, would you? Not until after I got the killer, sir. Something else for you to take care of? This man who called me. I don't have to beat him up, I just pay him money. He says there's a leak in your territory. Mr. No Legs, don't miss it. Hello, folks. Welcome back once again to the Crippled Theater. I am one guy on the show, but the other guy, I'd say right next to me, but I'm looking him to the right of me on my screen, so that's good enough. <laughs> uh, well, not good enough for him to be here, be here. That'd be awesome. But uh, yeah. Ricky, Ricky Morgan is here. How you doing, sir? Great, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm sitting here shaving off my big bushy eyebrows, even though I'm blind and I can't see, but, you know, we're going to talk about another movie. <laughs> <laughs> that pushes the boundaries of the little engine that could. <laughs> it, it, it has at least 30% less eyebrows, I think. Right. Yeah. <laughs> We're talking about the movie you heard in the trailer, uh, Mr. No Legs, or The Amazing Mr. No Legs, which, you know, mm-hmm. which the chair is the least impressive thing about him, in my opinion. But yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, your cheapo plot synopsis is heads roll as two cops, Chuck and Andy, go against Mr. D'Angelo, the biggest drug dealer in Florida, and his ruthless enforcer, Fred, who has no legs, 
but does have two mean double barrel shotguns built into his wheelchair. Uh, the stars. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, what else you need? <laughs> what else you need? Exactly, right? Uh, the stars Richard Jekyll as, as Chuck and uh, former former professional wrestler Ron Slinker. I'm not sure what he, what he came out as, as his partner Andy hmm. in this movie. Uh, Lloyd Bachner as, as D'Angelo, your drug dealer. And um, we're going to find the guy's name. He's pretty, pretty important. Uh, Rance forget, Howard shows up as Rance. Can't forget Rance. Don't forget your Rance, man. You know <laughs> Rance Howard as Lou, one of the subordinates of Mister D'Angelo, and um, starring Ted Volrath as Mister No Legs in this movie. And he's impressive. I I I got I got to get into that right now. Why he's so sure. impressive? Because he he um he does some martial arts in this movie and it, it looks strange in, in 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 our eyes, thinking like like it's, it's all a work. But this guy. Was was the real deal um, in so many ways. Um, fought in the Korean War, uh, lost both of his legs there, and, and, and uh, I imagine some kind of you know fatal things that would happen to his legs. I imagine he got shot terribly or blown up terribly. One of two. It doesn't say I, all I, that on IMDb. Figured it's probably a mine or something. You know. Yeah. You, you think about you know losing both legs like that, then yeah. I mean, but yeah. Come on, this this dude's bad. But um, didn't stop him, though. Um, began training in martial arts in 1967. and was the first person to earn a black belt in karate while training out of a wheelchair. Uh, eventually became a grandmaster and acquired black belts in several different styles of martial arts. And in uh, 1971, he founded the Martial Arts School for the Handicapable Incorporated, uh, organization, organization dedicated to teaching the martial arts to disabled people. And I, you know, to be in this oddity and for him to be, you know, the real deal is... Um, it, it doesn't hurt it. It, it helps me. It, right. Yeah, here we go. While serving in the Marine Corps, his legs got shattered by an enemy mortar shell in 1952 during a battle mm-hmm. near, in, near near uh, Incheon, Korea, when he was only 18. Uh, 13 years later, uh, his legs were finally taken off. But, um, wow. Yeah. Thank you, for your, thank you for your service and service in this movie, sure. sir. Because uh, wow. y- you elevated this donkey. <laughs> I'll give you that. <laughs> sure. Well, and, and again, of course, I didn't know any of the the backstory stuff that you were talking about here. So, I mean, come on, that's that's even greater than the fact that this movie has him in it doing what he does. The fact that he <clears throat> challenged himself to push himself beyond what you know. I'm sure people said, "No, you can't do that." And for him to fund his own martial arts school, that's pretty crazy. That's nice, man. Yeah, it's this, awesome. This is directed by Riku Browning, which if you don't know that name. <laughs> He is the one in the Creature from Black Lagoon that does the swimming scenes yeah. as the creature. He's, he's the only the creature, man. He's like the only living one that there is. So if you don't if you don't have uh something from him, he's like ninety something years old, so he's still uh he's still with us. And this is uh written with his uh apparently this 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 guy, Jack Cowden, the writer, and Riku Browning created Flipper. I had no idea. Yeah. But um Yeah, yeah he dir- he direct he was the director of Flipper. <laughs> I mean, I and, I, wa- and I watched a few episodes. Work on Gentle Ben too. Oh, nice! I watched a few episodes here and there of Flipper, but Gentle Ben wasn't because um, they played him on, on Nickelodeon when I was younger, younger. But they didn't show a lot of Gentle Ben on Nickelodeon, unfortunately. <laughs> who, who doesn't love that a man is bare? Come on, man! I mean, the transition of I'm the creature to Flipper to Mister No Legs. I mean, you can you can see that transition, right? Oh, totally. Yeah. Maybe the, the, the flipper to the to the creature thing, but not not so much the the other. But you know, right? <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah. This movie it it it, it, it takes place in a CD, whatever you want to call it. You know, you got these two cops, one of which has a sister who's who's in college, uh, hanging out with some some freaking degenerates that 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 tended some drugs. This this um this this movie starts with somebody rolling. Cocaine pills inside cigars or something. I don't know what's going on. It's with the drugs. Yeah. But um, yeah. he of, he of course you know tries to tries to play a game with Mister D'Angelo, you know, get, getting himself in trouble and actually kills his girlfriend, which is Andy's sister, and this sets all this into motion uh, along with um Mister D'Angelo's enforcer. But nothing to do with their death. But you know, there's a guy in a wheelchair who has guns attached to his wheelchair. He he could fire at any time i guess it's i guess that's the least impressive thing about him you know (laughs) double barrel shotguns but he's got these armrests on it and he hits the switch and the armrests drop down and it exposes these two double barrel shotguns and he just starts (laughs) blasting (laughs) which it's it's fun you know if you watch like stuff like um 
those Italian westerns where they have the gadgets right. and stuff. Like I think it's uh. Um, like Django, not, not Django, but um, R- Ringo, I think it is, is a series. Well, J- Django had the 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 big the big gun in the coffin. Yeah, yeah, that? yep, yep, yep. Yeah, stuff like that. You know, they're to use they use later in other films. It's a neat little gadget. You know, I, I do yeah. enjoy it. But you're right. I mean, it's it's not the most impressive thing. But you got to remember, what year is this? Seventy six. Seventy. Um, Seventy eight. There you go. Seventy eight. Yeah. So, I mean, it was it was all about, you know, how, you know, just doing something different, right? So, for this guy to have gadgets on a on a wheelchair, you know, you probably never seen that before. Yeah, so so there were this investigation and they they're you're wondering uh why why they, they why she she would do this because she's set up to have an overdose. But the dumbasses yeah. that didn't know how forensics work, they cuz they put the drugs in her system like a, uh, <laughs> an hour after she died, like they're not going to notice this. You know? <laughs> It's like, oh no, she's out of the smack, but not really. <laughs> she died anticipating the drugs hitting her system. Yes. <laughs> so terrified, the needle jumped into her vein after she died, and said, "Okay, there you go." Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, this film is also known as Gunfighter. I forgot to mention that, which is more, which is as accurate as Mister No Legs. We'll get into that in a little while. Yeah. <laughs> um, I got to mention Richard J- Richard Jekyll's car in this movie. Oh I, yeah, I think it's some kind of orange Camaro, but yeah, for 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 some reason they took on any you know identifiable tags off of the car, including the grill. It, it looks like a kit car, unfortunately. Yeah, it's but, definitely a Camaro, but still pretty badass. Yeah. yeah, it's bright orange, almost like the uh, the '76 gas stations. You know that old emblem, the the big round circle that said '76, and it was like that color orange, almost kind of a burnt. Bright orange. Yes, yeah, so that I always enjoy a cool car by by an older gentleman. You know, thank you, Jim Rockford, Rockford Files. You know, yes, cr- cruising around. See, that made him cool. You know, yeah. <laughs> that and the theme song, man. I thought I thought the Rockford Files were awesome just because of the theme song. <laughs> um, we don't go too deep into the plot here, but I'm going to ask Ricky. You know, what, what do you think about the film in general? Well. I was saying before we kind of got rolling here, there's something I just absolutely love about the 70s grindhouse era of movies because, you know, even though I'm a, I'm, I'm an 80s person through and through, as far as TV and movies, I've, I'm always a sucker for low-budget 70s movies. And because, like I said earlier when we were talking, you almost feel like you're not supposed to be seeing this. It's almost like you found this movie that's been put away that you're not supposed to see because it's nasty to some degree, right? Uh, it's like the, this movie was shot with the same camera that they just shot some 70s porn with. It, it just feels like, you know, one could run into the other and nothing would, you know, feel out of place. So I, I don't know. There's just something I love about this this time period of movies. And this one, I think it's funny that the movie's called Mr. No Legs. Obviously, he's the talking point of the movie, but the movie is not really his story. He just happens to be in the movie, you know, because he works for this guy and he, you know, kind of gets his, uh, they turn their back on him and stuff. And he has to kind of plot his own little revenge. But it, it's weird. It's called Mr. No Legs. But really, the story is about more of the cops. You know, it's more about Andy <laughs> than anything else. So, uh it's a it's a fun watch. Uh, I don't know that Rance plays a good bad guy or a drug dealer. I, I think because we've just seen him in so many other things, it's hard to see him that way. But you can't deny the Jekyll. I mean, anything he's in, I'm game. It's certainly elevating. Certainly elevating his partner, who should have a bigger role in this movie. They they should maybe should be a different different actor, but they got this big old hunky, like I said, former wrestler. Apparently, this guy was. You know, to, you to, know, to, and that oh, makes sorry. a lot of sense too because mm-hmm. the fight scenes are pretty dang good. So you've got this ex-pro wrestler, and then you've got Mr. No Legs, who's got this martial arts degree. That's why these fight scenes work. Yeah, yeah, we got to talk about the Mr. No Legs because um, our, our character, our title character, he gets screwed over by his subordinates, and he decides he, he's going to get revenge by, by killing some of his subordinates. And mm-hmm. it, it, yeah, with, with, with the guns, and there's a particular pool scene that, and anybody oh, listening yeah. to this has to at least have to watch that because. He gets to show off his his martial arts skills, but it starts with a ninja star on the side of his yeah, wheel. Absolutely, <laughs> just reaches down and pops it off the the spoke <laughs> in his wheelchair wheel, and he's ready for action. It's like somebody told me I was going to need this one day, and uh, here it is. <laughs> the moment is now. 
<laughs> Ninja Star. No, but it's great though because you, you get to see our our, our, our title character. He's doing some some push ups on the chair. Oh late, yeah, showing off for the ladies. Yeah. Oh yeah. Later on, he um he has to have this fight, and he's really showing off his um. I don't want to use the word stump, but he hits people with his stump. Okay, and it, it's pretty yeah. awesome. You know, that's the only way I can describe it. Is his bottom part of his body, and um, yeah. Man, this is fun to watch, and I, I can see why he had so. I, I, and I was looking, trying my damnedest to find some video of some possible competitions he was in, or and, and, and anything, and I couldn't find anything. And it kind of makes me sad. I, I like to see him, you know, do some yeah. stuff, you know, yeah, for real, yeah, in competitions type, you know. And it's not there. It's just not there. And yeah. um, it, it's amazing that he's like the the basis of the title and and the cover and all that good stuff and. But he's not really the big enemy, and he he gets dispatched about two thirds into this movie, unfortunately, yeah. and then it turns into the Dukes of Hazard <laughs> for some it reason. It really does, man. <laughs> the, the, I was gonna say you got you got the bar fight scene between the two girls, which oh my is God, pretty it's awesome. hilarious. Yeah, then you've got the pool scene, and you get well, you got Andy at the bar too after the girls fight, and he he throws some guys around, which looks really good. But then the pool scene, and then the car chase, man. I mean, it, this movie's got it. That that bar scene remind, reminds me so much of like the nothing scenes that are in street trash that make you laugh so hard. <laughs> right. Like the the scene where the guy goes in the grocery store, he's stealing all the groceries. Yeah. And, um, that bar scene, it's just like, hey, here's this girl. That's my. I think she's supposed to be his informant that he's waiting for, but mm-hmm. she's just in this bar starting shit with somebody, <laughs> and, and it turns into this big like battle breaking like comedic thing and. She gets stabbed with with a broken bottle, and there's yeah. a there's a little person in the back laughing his ass off. It's, <laughs> it's the '70s, man. That's the magic of the '70s. It's like anything goes. It didn't have to make sense. We're shooting a movie here. <laughs> no, that little person needed to be doing some martial arts. Is all I'm saying. I'd be, be, be amazing. For sure. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I I didn't see it, but I'm sure if I looked real hard, I could find it. But Jim Kelly shows up this movie for a hot second um, from <laughs> End of the Dragon and then Black Belt Jones and Oh yeah, yeah. That, that three, three, how, how can I not mention Three the Hard Way? That, that, that movie, too. You, know? you come straight out of a comic book. Mm-hmm. Oh, <laughs> so good. But yeah, this, this film, you know, I, I, I think, you know, the, when, when you learn that things about, you know, about the actor and, you know, performer, martial artist, and you see what you could do with, with, with no legs that, that a lot of men can't do with, uh, right. with full bodies. Yeah. It makes this film all that much more impressive to me. I, I don't know what sure. it is, you know. Well, so we it's just, I sorry. think the only thing, like I said, well, no, I'm sorry. I'm stepping on you, too. Oh, I think we got a little delay, but that's fine. But uh, again, it's like it's called Mr. No Legs, but really he's he's not in it a lot. I mean, <laughs> you know, he shows up, he shoots some people, goes, I don't care if they die. They needed to die. And, you know, so he's got this attitude, and he's a pretty good hit guy. But you just figure that the movie would be more about following him around and – him being a bad guy, getting his back turned, which all this stuff happens, but it's not the main focus of the movie, which makes it really kind of odd. You, you got to love that he looks kind of unassuming, too, that he, he rolls up in this wheelchair, he's got no legs, and he's got like a like a 10-year-old boy's haircut going on. <laughs> <laughs> he's like this big stocky dude. You know? Yeah, yeah, the haircut kind of, yeah, it kind of throws it a little bit for sure. <laughs> hey, you know, he he's too busy learning martial arts. He ain't got time to learn to cut his own hair. Man, ain't that true, man? <laughs> I just seen a picture of the little dude. You know, it's hilarious. He's got a big old little big old hat on and stuff. Damn, that's funny. It's so funny. <laughs> it's so random. Like I said, it seems like that, and like um for, for no reason, and they they, they they mess up Richard Jekyll's whip, which is the most tragic death in the whole movie. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Because D'Angelo steals his car and he's chasing behind him in a, in a, in a damn um. In the police car, and one of the most amazing things happened. And I love, I love this trope about these ra- this random thing just sitting in the road, and how, how D'Angelo is taken out. Well, how, and how unfortunately our detective's car is taken out is there are random blocks of ice in the way, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, <laughs> you know he's gonna run into them. You just wait right. for it to happen. <laughs> you know, right. I mean, there's no other reason for the ice to be there. I mean- <laughs> But you know, yeah, I gotta admit the the cop car that's coming over the 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 draw bridge bridge is going up and it runs over the top of those cars. I mean, it's got some Smokey and the Bandit things going on here. Oh, some great stunts, you know. For I, I'd imagine this film was very cheap to make, you know. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, lots of fun, man. I I I, I get down with with the 
again, J. Cole just, you know, he's one of those actors that, that would elevate this, this inexperienced actor's performance. He does oh, yeah. it real well. And, yeah, um, it's funny. My, my wife walked through when I was watching it, and she's like, you know, she pointed out to D'Angelo. She's like, I've seen that guy in 100 movies. And J. Cole, I'm, that guy's been in 100 movies. And then, of course, Rance, and she's like, what kind of movie is this? I'm like, 70 schlock, baby. <laughs> It's Mr. No Legs, baby. Come on. <laughs> Either you're on board or you're not. You know? That's right. <laughs> she wasn't, so. <laughs> Damn it. But, but that's um, what's impressive about this time period, again, because these these people would make these movies, and they were in tons of stuff back then. And you would think, you know, is is there a level that is too low for you to do these movies? And it's probably favors. They probably know the director a good friend they trying to make this movie and they you know do it for a small fee or whatever so i don't know i, I would imagine the 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 market was a little different during the 70s like that with all the independent you know filmmakers running around doing stuff and buddying up with people i mean you watch you, you, work, you watch many films like this you can watch there's a film called the glove that features john saxon yeah it's it's about a guy who who murders who's a murderer on the loose and he's the he think he's the detective but this guy has fashioned uh, like a like a metal gauntlet that can crush people's heads. Mm-hmm. This is a yeah. movie for the seventies, people. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it can't be made any other decade yeah. except for the seventies. Poor John Saxon, he was always the detective. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I can't tell you how many times I watched a movie, you know, like random movie because that's that's what one of the best things about the internet is about social media is that people say, "Hey, look at this random thing." It's like, "Hey, I've never seen it before, so it's new to me." And then you watch yeah. it and you say, "Hey." Yeah, that can only be made in the seventies. It cannot be made now. You know, That's right. yeah. <laughs> never <True>. ever. <laughs> yep, no doubt about it. <laughs> Any uh, final things you want to say about Mister No Legs, sir? Uh, you know, if you like, if you like the seventies grindhouse stuff, this this is a must watch. I mean, it fits right in there between they call her left eye and rollerball, or <laughs> it just kind of works with whatever. It, it is just a slice of seventies Americana. There's not so much corporate greed in this movie, okay, like in Rollerball, you know. Right, that's true. But but you, but you got to root for old Jonathan E in that movie. <laughs> that, uh, one of my most favorite closing shots in any movie is Rollerball. It's so fucking satisfying. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, this is this is great, though. I, I recommend watching it, you know, with, with, with maybe the new information that you have. If you ever seen it before, you say, wow, this, 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 because you, you, you'd see him doing this stuff in the chair, and you'd think, oh, this is just the work. But now, right. that you, now that you know it's not a work, that he was the real deal, right. no, lo- yeah. no longer with us, unfortunately. Um, but he um, kicked some ass over a lot of adversity, and I admire that greatly. And I admire this film more because of that. It elevates I it, I think. Totally agree. Oh, my gosh. Without Mr. No Legs, we'll see you next time with an 80s film about a wheelchair that actually does some more shit than that. this wheelchair. <laughs> See, it's, they just they took it to the next level, didn't they? They turned it up to eleven. They turned it to eleven, man, with a um, post-apocalyptic sort of film. It features Tiny Zeus Lister and a, a handicapped kid that's gonna like tear him up because it's uh, some vigilantes for their, I guess, to stay alive. I never seen this before. But I'm excited to watch it again. Look on the internet, you'll find some shit. Wired to Kill from 1986. Oh man, I can't wait. <laughs> Yeah, I haven't seen it either, so I'm, I'm excited about this one. But you guys can find that on YouTube to, to watch for free. Do you want to watch before we our review? So uh, check out that there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Rick. Yeah, anytime, man. And uh, we'll be right back with something else. <laughs> it's it's odd that, you know, uh, Lori came from such a different... Uh... Right, a completely different path. I was uh, uh, brought up in a very small town just... Uh, south of the Chicago city limits, and just far enough away to have been peopled with pure and adulterated white trash. <laughs> and uh, because I was one of so many children, um, I don't believe that anyone noticed when I blew town at 15 and ended up in San Francisco, California. And it's at this point in my story that the dark clouds part <laughs> because I met a certain Mr. Wiseman who gave me a job in his shop. And before long, he tapped me to do some small roles in some of his short films <laughs> for more mature audiences and uh, before long I had landed if you will some leads and uh, then I started to do some uh, cameos um, well I was known for uh, doing a certain thing that many of the other girls wouldn't do and of course I loved to sing ever since I was a little girl and um, I learned to play the ukulele in one of my last films uh, Not So Tiny Tim 
Finally, in the news tonight, the music world mourns the death of folk music icon Irving Steinblum. Steinblum managed the careers of the Main Street singers, the Folksmen, and Mitch and Mickey. The only fit fitting tribute that, that we could come up with was a memorial concert. I'd like to think that Mitch would agree to do this, because I already said yes. Where else could we have such an event, the town hall? We're very pleased to be having the folk people here. The acoustics are, are just perfect. Well, there's a party in the parlor and You went to the record store, you knew that the new Folksman album would be one word, title, itching, uh, wishing, rambling, singing. But uh, they had no, uh, they had no hole in the center of the records. And uh, yeah, yeah, if you punched a hole in them, you'd have a good time. Yeah. It's just that time. My dad, Fred Knox, was an original Main Street singer. He's a dead person now, but he, when he was alive, he was so happy. There had been abuse in my family, uh, but it was mostly musical in nature. There's a kiss at the end of the rainbow. I must say, I was in awe of Mitch and Mickey. <laughs> Who was it? Mitch was mysterious and intense. I don't remember much. Uh... I'm so excited to be part of this project. Oh, absolutely. It's something of a challenge for me because I don't like folk music. Mm -hmm. Me too. Quick plug, all I am Mike LaFontaine, owner and founder of High Class Management. <laughs> Whoops! <laughs> I had a hit that you might have heard of, Hoodie Legit Little Goman, which means How's It Hanging, Grandma? Are those are lights hanging up there? Yes, those are lights. Could they fall? And that's a ceiling above us. <laughs> Excuse me, I must be full. <laughs> it's like a wire. I see a wire. I see a. Oh! I feel ready for a voyage on this magnificent vessel. I love Mitch. What if we see selfish? But... Hello, folks. Uh... Welcome back to the show, uh, where we're here to do one more Christopher Guest review for you guys, and that is A Mighty Wind from 2003. And uh, with us tonight, uh, blowing peace and freedom and blowing you and me, is uh, <laughs> Su Suzanne is here. How you doing, girl? What's happening? Uh, not <laughs> much. I had to do it. You I had, had to do it. You had to do it? Beautiful. <laughs> After a brief meltdown, I'm here and I'm happy to be here. That's okay. Meltdowns are important here, Dan. To vent to somebody, you know. Um, with us tonight also is the lovely Iris. Hello, hello. How are you all doing? Oh, fine. Fine, fine, fine. <laughs> and our special guest panelists for, for, for this review. Um, you may know him from the Friday Nightmares podcast and his um, Smoke Show OnlyFans account, as Heather would love to say. You know, he he is. Um, I'm not going to give the big introduction. He gives himself every show, just to you know blow gremlins or whatnot. I don't know what he does, but uh, <laughs> he's here. He's bearded. He's wax vaxxed and all of that, all that stuff. Uh, from Swords Creek, Michigan, this is Smoke Show with Scott Crawford. How you doing, sir? going on everybody i'm man i just uh i'm very happy to be here and i'm hoping by the end of this i get a kiss oh Aww. <laughs> that would entertain heather to no end if i fucking gave you a kiss at the end of the rainbow is all i'm saying oh, about that you know oh god I, no, that you could set your only fans paid up with yeah, yeah y'all ain't y'all ain't getting that shit for free thought. you ain't getting that shit the beard you ain't getting that shit for free well, we'll see. You, but you buy the cow, you get the Scott for free. No, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. You know? I mean, you always get the Scott. I mean, I give myself up. No problem. <laughs> but yeah, we're here to talk about a mighty wind, uh, which is another mockumentary in the Christopher Guest oeuvre. Um, this this is a, a a story about a folk producer who um, dies. So they're going to put a concert with his his major acts that he brought up and, and loved and the the conflicts that occur within the making of this concert. And this has uh many of your principal cast members that you you knew from the other CRISPR guest uh ones. 
uh, Catherine O'Hara as Mickey Crab, uh, Eugene Levy as Mitch Cohen, and, uh, Mickey and Mitch right there. Um, this, this of course, reunites uh, Spinal Tap in a film. Uh, Harry Shearer as Mark Shove, Michael McKeon as Jerry Popalter, and Christopher Guest as Alan Barrows. So that, that's special. Uh, Jane Lynch shows up, shows up in a much major major role in this movie um, as Laurie Bonner, John Michael Higgins again uh, underutilized in in everything but these movies. Uh, Terry Bonner as Terry Bonner, uh, Parker Posey, a delightful as as Sissy Knox, Fred Willard. What happened as Michael La- La Fontaine, <laughs> uh, Bob Balaban as Jonathan uh, Steinblum. Uh, the, the son of the patriarch there, one of the sons. Jennifer Coolidge shows up again. Uh, Larry Miller shows up again with a delightful pony nub for no reason. I don't know why that thing exists, but it's, it's magical. Uh, <laughs> Ed Bagley Jr. is Lars uh, O'Flynn, who, who puts on the concert. Paul Dooley shows up again, you know, bless him. And I, did, I didn't see her. I got to go back and look for this now. Mary Gross shows up in this movie. And I always love when she shows up in things, so now i got to go back and look again, because I missed that. Uh. Oh, she's only there very, very, it's very, seconds. very briefly. i, I got to look anyway, though. It's, it's, she's one of the original Main Street singers. Uh, I'm, I'm the, that kid that grew up in the wee feds and watched it one too, way too many times. And uh, oh. <laughs> One day on the show, ladies, one day on the show, I promise. <laughs> um... But I have a good time with the tunes in this 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 movie and the, the acting, everything about it. Um, music and lyrics by our Spinal Tap panelists, and, and as well as um, as well as um, Eugene Levy and Catherine O'Hara, and Michael McKean's wife uh, has some writing credits. And Annette O'Toole, they're married, and she has a, a writing credit on this as well. They they wrote "A Kiss at the End of the Rainbow," which I'm sure we'll talk about and probably weep about because that's a song in this movie. That's a uh, pretty freaking special, but I'll kick it to our guests first. The Smoke Show. What's your thoughts? Your initial thoughts on the Mighty Wind? Oh man, so this uh, I'm I'm kind of new to Christopher Guest movies. I've only seen Best in Show, and I freaking love that movie. Um, so when you offered me to join the podcast for uh, one of the show episodes, I was like, all right, I hope I get a Mighty Wind because that's one I've always wanted to check out, and I got the lucky straw and. Man, I am so happy I got this one. This was just so freaking funny and entertaining and kind of heartwarming. And also just the music is amazing. I'm a, I am love folk music and this was great and like beautifully done. But holy shit, I just got to say, Eugene Levy, with the way he talks throughout this movie, just steals the freaking show for me. <laughs> I I kind of like doing this fun. I, I just, I love it. And yeah, the combination between him and Catherine O'Hare, like as always, just so good. Uh, cause yeah, I love, and I love seeing them in, uh, Schitt's Creek now. So that just made me very happy to see them again back in the, from back in the day. Cool. Iris. Okay. First of all, I have to say that I'm very grateful for model trains or else without <laughs> them, we wouldn't have real trains. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. You know, that woman, is, uh, the fucking screen anytime she is on it because she is funny and she I don't know I just love her but this movie in itself it's lots of fun I mean you know I it's kind of funny but I was talking with um, a friend of mine Robin from uh, another podcast Uh, (laughs) and uh, I was telling her that you know I know people like this I mean like in real life Uh, there is a uh, gentleman by the name of Jim and his he was he is a basically a a hippie type of artistic dude and his wife was a music teacher and you know they it was guitar and uh, dulcimer just like them and um sadly she passed away a couple of years ago but you know he he is that dude he is mitch i mean he walks around just like lost and they lived on a commune and everything you know it's Knowing stage people is funny because you can see every single person that you, in this movie, it's like, you, you know, someone, you know, someone that acts like this. Um, the music in this is fucking amazing. 
Um, I'm not too much into the folksy music, but you know, I like music to tell stories and, and that's basically what these guys are doing. And I think the music's great. The singing is amazing. Uh, done by the actors themselves. Uh, <laughs> and of course, you know, who wouldn't want to worship another dimension where color is the 49th vibration? We are the 49th vibration of color. I mean, wink. how would you not know that? You know, anybody walking <laughs> down the street would know that, right? <laughs> but, you know, they, they don't fly around on birds. No, they wear the witchy hats, but they don't fly on birds. No. No, this movie is so much fun. It's just such quirkiness. And then, of course, Bob Balaban. Um, John, I mean, this guy, uh, obviously, he had a Jewish mother. They're very overbearing. They played They played polo. They played polo on Shetland ponies, you know. So they wouldn't fall far. Uh, had to wear a football helmet when he was in the chess club. Um, <laughs> the, the fact that he's, like, walking around. He's on stage, and he's, like, he's, like, are those lights up hanging up there? Is that a wire? <laughs> oh, don't get it. manager just slaps him on the head. <laughs> I was like, enough. <laughs> and, and don't get, you know, your eye gouged out by an apple blossom for the yeah, love like of God. An apple blossom and, you know, old people in wheelchairs are going to get tangled up in the vines. I mean, and this guy, <laughs> he... Every character, I mean, just takes it just, you know, to that place where it's just over the top because the most creative people that are on stage are over the top because if they weren't, they wouldn't be on stage. So true. Um, and, you know, and Mickey and Mitch, you know, it, it's that typical, you know, love story that, you know, the two artists met, they fell in love, and there was a nasty breakup, and they never talked to each other. So, uh, and then here they are back. And each one has their version of the kiss of like, well, you know, I wasn't leading him on. And then he's like, well, I wasn't leading her on. But it's it's cute. And I have to say, depending on what mood I'm in, uh, the song at the end uh, where, where, you know, they say, you know, uh, the kiss at the end of the rainbow. Sometimes I get like a little teary eyed because it's such a sweet song. And to see the two characters that have been at odds with each other for so long. And they do kiss. It's kind of cute. But anyway. Uh, but yeah, uh, this is a great movie. Um, not one of my favorite, but pretty close to it. Suzanne. I have a theory. I think that this movie is Spinal Tap in an alternate dimension. Okay. Okay, oh. like a folk song Spinal Tap. <laughs> no, I'm listening. I really believe it, it is. Because, I mean, it was, as I was watching it, I've se- I can't even count how many times I've seen this movie. And when they're talking to the one, you know, the magazine writer, his name, and this this is what made me think of it, is Martin Berg, the guy that Paul Benedict, or as I always like to call him, Bentley. Um, and the filmographer was Marty DeBerge. Yeah. And, like I said, you see the same three in The Folksman. And you have these other acts around them. But I swear to God, they he wrote this and set them in a folk music alternate timeline. Well, so it's Spinal Tap, but now they're the folks. I don't want to interrupt you, but they, they do have a genuine genuine Spinal Tap moment in the movie. At least one that I could recall is where, oh, yeah. where the Main Street singers do their song first that they're going to do. And then... <laughs> Harry Shearer. He goes, uh, just, 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 just a second here, as, a, as a hypothetical, what say we do wandering? <laughs> <laughs> and then he, he, he yells at him without yelling at him, you know. It's just kind of wonderful. Oh, it's, like, it's like the Stonehenge thing. Oh, I know. And like, that, I straight up, that's, what, I mean, once again, but I think maybe just because I watched them so close together and I've never watched those two movies within a week or so of each other. And all of a sudden, this just jumped at me. So there's that, and I absolutely love, there's just, once again, as Iris said, the quirkiness. But, I mean, going back to the song, The Kiss at the End of the Rainbow, there is something incredibly heartwarming and touching about that entire thing, because everybody comes out, Michael McKean is sitting there, it's like, oh, it's such a pretty song, are they going to do the kiss? And everybody is flooding side stage to get a glimpse to see if they're actually going to do it. And yes, I actually did 
shed a tear because it is just a beautiful song. And I, I couldn't remember, but I, I, I was pretty sure that was the song that got nominated for an Oscar. I don't think it won. Fucking should have. But that that scene is for me. I think that's like the pinnacle of the movie. And you go through your rapid thing at the end of what everybody is up to. I think Mickey and Maud are Maud. What the hell? <laughs> Did I mention Mickey? My God, where the hell is my head tonight? I think theirs is the funniest because she's there, you know, you know, pimping Sherflo, and he's writing poetry again, and he's like, I'm so open now. <laughs> I didn't want to leave her on. And the folks been playing casinos, which awesome. And, well, we have a drastic transformation that happened, too, which yes. the first... You die the first time you see the movie. You're like, what? Okay, I, I, I get that you're all about, you know, taking care of your skin. Well, you know. But apparently, maybe that was the next logical step for him. You know, Norwegian fishermen, they use hand cream all the time. Just throwing it out there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just, it's so, there's so many things. That, and ours, we, talk, we talked a lot about Bob Balaban, but he is at his absolute neurotic best in this movie i'm very very organized and he's sitting there moving things around like yeah i, I know that feels and like i said the the apple blossom like somebody's gonna put their eye out they get tangled in this vine That's some very low-hanging and, vines so watch out for those <laughs> but when the stage manager goes and slaps him upside the head you just can't help but fucking fall out laughing that is one of the funniest scenes in the movie and this one for me it's not like is laugh out loud funny it's some of the other things there's just, there's, I guess it's just kind of, they're playing a lot on the nostalgia and making it work very well of, you know, bygone days and folk music and all the folk clubs and how everybody knew each other. And they brought, for me, I think they did a great job. And, you know, some of the songs that the Main Street singers did were just funny as hell. I was like, you get the sweet potato going and the... Uh, yeah, I, I, I started singing that while I was watching the movie. I'm like, you need to make that stop. Do it. <laughs> Keep singing that song. <laughs> you know what? I kind of agree with the folksmen, or the folkmen. Um, those really aren't folk songs. Those are, like, ditties. Yeah. So, you know, because, I, yeah, it does tell a story, but it's a, woohoo, yay, happy-go-lucky story. Um, it, it, yeah, it does fit more into the ditty category than a folk song. Right. Is it? But with folk songs, there's always some kind of deepness to them. Exactly. Like the last song, A Mighty Wind. I, yeah. I love that song, right? Because it totally encompasses, and, and it's kind of like the personification of the time when they were, you know, they were it. They were the big thing. It was a time of, you know, um, civil rights and the civil rights movement, the, the women's movement, uh, all of that. And, you know, what it says uh, yeah, freedom and equality. So it, uh, to me, that is the perfect full song. And I, I'm glad that that's what they ended up. Of course, you know, it's Christopher Guest. Why wouldn't yeah. he do that? But yeah, um, I kind of agree with the folks. Man. They're just too happy-go-lucky. <laughs> yeah, and they're they're kind yeah. of like the fake knockoffs. They're not the actual yes. Main Street singers. They're the new Main Street singers. And the only one that's actually got any connection is Sissy. And I'm sorry, Parker Posey is just as cute as a fucking button in this movie, especially when she's playing her ukulele for the class. And oh, they're all just sitting, Oh, yeah, I mean, she's just sitting there and playing and just big ass smile on her face. And the kids are like, oh, my God, what the fuck fresh hell is this? <laughs> <laughs> but there's a, this is just one of those movies that for me, it's basically a warm bowl of popcorn. I'm always happy to go spend some time with it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I love this. This is the, these two films we're covering on this show are probably my favorite ones at all, and for 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 good reason. Um, John Michael Higgins as Terry Bonner, you know, like this is as an actor, but as a musician and as a singer, I I think he needs to utilize that more in in, in other things because he he's not utilized today, and it makes me sad. Like I said in the the best in show review, he just uh he needs to do more. I mean, he's he's great in this movie and t telling the story about how he became. I became in love with the Main Street Singers, which is basically his father, you know, locked him in a room. He built the Main Street Singers on gin boxes. 
Yeah, and then the Main Street Singers, his his abuse was musical in nature. Yeah. <laughs> that whole introduction, and I gotta say, Jane Lynch, she's from where I'm, where I'm from, from Dalton, Illinois. She went to Thornridge High School. So when she's doing her little schmeal about, you know, leaving, you know, that town just south of Chicago, you know, which had poor, unadulterated white trash in it, that that's that's a jab and a love at, at Dalton. And I, I, I gotta say... That that part I did not notice till these these viewings for this show, and I was like, "Wow, that's that's fucking awesome." That she because she she still shows a lot of love for that fucking shit town she's from, and I that I'm from, and I think right now if we watch TV around me and Suzanne, she does a tourism commercial for Illinois now. Oh, nice. Yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah, the folksmen, uh, they they they're they're, they're, they're wonderful. Uh, Harry Shearer just being awkward and. It's 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 amazing the, the the whole the whole thing about oh he caught me in the bathroom I threw my hands down and you know reminded me of his father t- catching him in the act with, with the hand cream and it, it's it's end up talking a little, little quirky shit like we're talking about with how the, how the records came out and this one was big and then we got to pushed out of the lower label and the record didn't even have a hole in it or something he says and it's it's, it's Oh, yeah. <laughs> you had to drill your own hole, and hopefully you got it center. <laughs> but it sounded wobbly. good. <laughs> it, would, it would just wobble on the spindle. Um, good sound quality, though. <laughs> yes, yeah, good sound quality, for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, the, 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 the lyrics of some of these songs, you, you mentioned potatoes in the paddy wagon. It's, it's a really... It's a really bad thing to say about your baby that she has the face of a parboiled yam, you know, because yeah. it's like, oh, wow, that's, that's, uh, that's ugly, man. My mama yeah. fell down the stairs and just had her there. Yeah. I, was, I Oh, my God. Make me, don't let me sing anymore. Oh, it, it'll happen one day. Um, the Mitch and Mickey stuff, I, 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 we just lost Naomi Judd. So it's I mean yeah 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 I'm sorry yeah Naomi Judd and you hear interviews with her about her depression this is where I get serious about things about her staying in her house for, for three weeks at a time not taking a shower in the same clothes and having to put on that face for the people and the whole idea of him you know falling because they don't really explain a lot of why why they broke up they just explain the anger of what happened when they broke up. But, mm-hmm. you know, that little, that little level of depression, you know, I, I think about my, my mother quite a bit when Naomi, Naomi, Naomi Judd talks about her depression, and that, that's, I just cry a little more, let's put it that way, <laughs> you know. Um, but their songs, in, in, not just in the movie, but in, on, on the, the soundtrack album, there's a song called The Ballad of Bobby and June that's not in the movie, but it's a, it's a wonderful song. You guys should check it out if you guys haven't yet. Um, but that that song, which I hear people have played at their weddings, uh, "A Kiss at the End of the Rainbow," it's a lovely song. And there's a part in this movie where they're they're at um, Mickey's house and they're rehearsing, and you can see, you know, when he's playing and she's playing, and they're looking at each other, and you can see something clicks there, and that's just that that you know that love that that literal love for each other, and you know the um the compatibility of as an as an actor and an actress and there's something in that look like he's he's, he's ready to go at that point and of course so he's not ready to go again because he's that neurotic and it, it, the little stuff he does in this movie <laughs> like when the husband takes him down to go see the model train and he keeps calling it crab bill instead of crab town i think crab bill would look beautiful <laughs> in the autumn <laughs> Put some some trees over there uh, with with the leaves, and you know it's 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 really it's really crazy. He, he, he doesn't play roles like this. He's a lot more ex, you know exuberant and, and wild. But this is a really reserved role for him for for a lot of, a lot of reasons. Just that's what the character is, and he learned to play guitar for this movie, and Parker Posey learned to play the mandolin for this movie. So the fact that all these people. You know, I mentioned how much I love the film Nashville, the Robert Altman film Nashville, because those actors in that movie wrote and performed their own music in that movie as well. I, I, I love shit like that. 
It's oh, just... yeah. And once again, you also got an Oscar nomination for Keith, Car- Keith Carradine's song. Mm-hmm. You get you. It, it gives a new level to you know what you're seeing on the screen, and that's that's uh that's important. Oh my gosh! Yeah, it gives it more of a level of authenticity. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I definitely gotta say, like I uh, with uh with Mitch and uh Mickey uh like er yeah um but yeah those two like just just the chemistry between those two like if it wasn't those actors I don't know if it would have been the same because yeah Eugene Levy and Kathy Kath. Catherine O'Hare both just have such great chemistry together. Yeah, you need that, man. That's good shit. <laughs> yeah. But um, the main, the new Main Street singers, I, I, I love, you know, watching them perform because it's, it's the toothpaste commercial, as Michael McKeon says in this movie, and they're just so, you know, happy and, you know, smiling and, you know. <laughs> there's um, a song about where they sing about Bible stuff called The Good Book Song. Which I've listened. I've listened to the soundtrack on my phone for at least I think like fifteen times in the past month, just because I turn it on every once in a while, and I'm I'm just singing along with the good book song, and you know any any um any Mitch and Mickey song, which if you're wearing a mask, which is one of the most greatest things in the world for something like this, you can sing shit like this in a grocery store, and they're none the wiser. Okay, none the wiser. <laughs> <laughs> So good, man. If you haven't listened to the soundtrack album, though, there's, there's stuff on there that's not in the movie, like like that one song I had mentioned. And songs in full, uh, if you don't own the Blu-ray or DVD, it's, it's, it's on both. Um, great extras on there. You can watch the whole concert in full on there, the, as, as, it was, if it, as if it was aired on TV. You can watch it on there. And, of course, deleted scenes, because this is, you know, mostly... Fucking imp- improvised, you know, with very little script there, which I, I, which makes me happy about the Dalton dig because I I I I I'd have to ask her myself, but I would imagine that's something she threw in on her own. But this poor white trash girl from from the south from the south suburbs of Chicago, you know, and people that know know what she's talking about. <laughs> that's, all, <laughs> that's all I'll say about that one, you know. <laughs> um. But yeah, I, I catch myself singing this stuff all the time. Old Joe's place, the the, the Folksman song that really sticks out for me, because X made a made a post uh, <laughs> on Facebook last night. I wish he could have been here for this, but he's he's semi retired and he's he's hanging out with his wifey and stuff. Um, he just he simply put E O A, you know, because you look for that busted neon sign, and that's what it says. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, e O O, yeah, that X is fucking. That's my man. But I love that he did that. Like, what what I what I respond to? I was like, is there always something cooking there? You know. <laughs> so, so fucking good. Um, I'll kick it back to Scotty. Anything else you want to say about the film? And um, what do you rate a one to ten? Uh, well, I was gonna say like uh talking about the soundtrack i actually did uh download this on spotify like af- immediately after i watched the movie because i was just like oh my god these songs are incredible and i could do this all day long and but now like you guys have summed this up way better than i ever like uh but like yeah i am so glad that i was able to watch this because i've actually had a screener copy of this movie on dvd from when it was released and just sat on my shelf sat on my shelf sat on my shelf so when I got chose to do this movie, I was like, hell yes, finally get to bust this open and watch it. Still had the whole uh, screener disclaimer at the bottom of the screen and everything, which just kind of brought back some nostalgia for me from my old uh, days with my stepdad and like his movie collection. Um, but yeah, I just absolutely adore this film. And uh, like it's got that, like like you guys were saying, it's quirky, but it has like that almost like British dry sense of humor to compared to like uh, Best in Show. And I freaking love that so much. And like every character in this is just like very, very entertaining to watch on the screen. Um, but yeah, as for a rating for this, I would give this uh, eight out of ten. This is just very enjoyable and something I will watch over and over and over again. Cool, Suzanne. Oh, I still love this, and I did forget to mention. Well, I did. I, I did mention his little catchphrase. We're happening. They can't do my work. But for me, this is going to sound kind of goofy, but, you know, he always plays a part in these movies, not Spinal Tap, but that wasn't a Christopher Guest movie. But for me, he's like the goat cheese that pulls the whole thing together. 
he's his presence and just he's never plays the same character twice he's always so out there and his horrible show ideas for the main street singers and for me i i can't believe i didn't mention him when i was going through my review but like i said he's the he's like the glue that holds that it's it's like that one string that goes all the way through the movie and it's fred willard I got an idea. I got I got an idea for your act. Uh, you know, Cat, that they have in Moby Dick? We could just throw a bunch of water on stage and say, there she blows, especially on the women. Get out of your guitar. Turn your guitars upside down and empty the water out. Especially on the women. <laughs> and then he goes over and whispers into Oh, yes. This is, this movie, I've always, always, always enjoyed. I enjoy... There, there is not a single frame in any of these movies that I had, I do not enjoy, and it's you can, it's one of those you always notice something different. It's like same with Best in Show, even the same with Spinal Tap and Guffman. Some little thing that you knew was there, but you didn't pay that much attention to it at first. And I still think this is Spinal Tap in an alternate folk music universe. But yeah, I'm pretty much not as much my favorite as. Best in show, but it's a solid nine out of ten for me. Iris, um, yeah, this is I kind of like I, I, I'm with Suzanne. Uh, it's fun, it's quirky, the music is kick ass. Um, the writing, well, uh, uh, let's just say the uh ad lib is amazing, the editing too, just like uh, the other movies that we've discussed. But uh, this one, I'm gonna give like an 8.5. Um, it's not best in show, but it tried really hard. That's fair enough. Um, you know, harmonies are hard and you know, these are, these are actors who became musicians and some of the harmonies in this film really click with me. And usually when I'm at work, I'll, I'll keep one earphone off, you know, to hear what people are telling me. But you know, when, when this is on, I'll put both earphones on. Because you then you miss those harmonies otherwise, and I don't I don't like that. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's 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 wonderful. If you haven't seen it before, you you, you want to you know smile and be sad at the same time, and you get get some quick jokes in there. I mean, Jane Lynch is she's on point with the quick jokes and. She she's talking. We forgot about her little trick. She, she her little trick. Yeah, she talked about. <laughs> Talking about her her her, her foray in mature movies, and you know, she learned how to play the ukulele, in which she started one of her last films, Not So Tiny Tim. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we're just nonchalantly talking about her freaking stint in mature films. Oh my god, that had me dying. <laughs> so funny, man. I I, I can't stand. It. But um, I'm with Iris with that 8.5. It's not as good as Best in Show, but I get as much enjoyment out of it as I do Best in Show. So yeah, th- these are, these are my two my two favorites on this episode, and not Disson Guffman or, or um, Spinal Tap, but these um these two right here are the ones I'll go to j- just about every time, and um, the the music has a lot to do with it, and the performances of course, and the fact that they're all in, you know. They're all in the whole thing, and it's not like there's there's not a there's not a kink in the armor there, and I I gotta appreciate a pure good. I I, I mentioned films that I watch, even if they're bad, that are pure good. This this is something I can turn on that's pure good, right there with the Village People movie. Suzanne uh, can't stop the music. Oh God! <laughs> it's 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 not a good movie in the traditional way, but you know what? When that milkshake song hits, I'm, I'm all for it, man. You know. It's kind of like Xanadu. I yes, yes. I watching it, loving it when I was like eight or eight, you know, hey, eight, nine years hey, old. Hey, hey, hey. Let, were let me stop you right there. It. You love Xanadu now too, okay? I'm just throwing it out there, okay? It does, uh... <laughs> oh. <laughs> Xanadu's got a special place in my heart when you had us watch it for Is It Really That Bad? So. <laughs> no, that was somebody else made you watch that, but I'll make you watch it anyway, Scotty. You know, any day of the week, you know. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, a funny Xanity story when Pat and I went to New Orleans for a vacation a couple of years ago. You know, we're just, we're, we basically bumped into the first New Orleans esque bar that we found. And, you know, we're sitting there drinking amazing local beer and having our third bowl of gumbo in two hours. And, you know, we're, for some reason, the, we had just done that podcast with Xanadu. 
and we're talking about the bartender from like half all the way across the bar with lots of people in there comes over and he's like did you say xanadu like yes i did because it's infectious that's why you know <laughs> So we, he actually sat over there, ignored other patrons, just didn't talk to me and Pat about Xanadu. It was it was kind of awesome. Nice, but yeah, this this has been the the Mighty Wind review, and we'll uh, come right back to close out the show. Hello. Hello. Who is this? Who are you trying to reach? I don't know. Oh, I think you've got the wrong number. I'm gonna hang up. Wait, don't hang up. What's that noise? Popcorn? You're making popcorn. Uh huh. I only eat popcorn when I listen to podcasts. I'm about to listen to a podcast. Oh, really? Which one? Probably the podcast on Haunted Hill. Is that the one with the two guys with the beards? Uh, yeah, Dan and Gav. Dan and Gav, yeah. That podcast was scary. I liked it. Most episodes, they look at two different horror movies. Each episode, they look at a world of the strange, where they look at weird things from around the world. Sometimes, they even do special episodes where they look at different genres or directors' discographies and talk about them. Do you have a boyfriend? Maybe. So where can I find the podcast on Haunted Hill? Well, you can go to legionpodcast.com, Facebook, Twitter, or just go into iTunes and search for the podcast on Haunted Hill. So, are you going to ask me out? Um... All right, kids, this is the, the kiss at the end of the rainbow, as uh, Scotty said on the opening of the one review for Mighty Wind. And uh, th- that kiss, and I haven't done this in a long time, uh, talked about somebody who died, but we lost uh, some pretty cool people recently. And uh, one that stood out to me as a young comic book fan who, you know, whilst my cousin was making out with his girlfriends in his bedroom while he was supposed to be hanging out with me, you know, no love lost there. I dove into those long boxes in his closet, and I, I pulled out many of books that were drawn by uh, this man. Neil Adams was um, a comic book artist for, for DC and Marvel, respectively. Did a lot of cool Batman books, and he um, did, notoriously did um, the, the, the Green Lantern and Green Arrow uh, book, which, you know, why it's controversial is a long time ago there was something called the Comic Code, where you couldn't show certain things in a book. Well, the interesting storyline where um, Speedy, Green Arrow's um, sidekick, which was his sister on the Arrow TV show, if you guys didn't know, that they, they changed it up for that. But um, Speedy got addicted to drugs, like hard drugs, and they had to be really careful you know, around, around this. And this, this book has won awards before, and he's won many awards. Uh, should be commended and, and loved if you haven't looked up uh, some of Neil Adams' work. You guys should go check that out. Uh, how does this pertain to cinema? Well, let me tell you. Neil Adams um, has done many cool poster art. He did the pencils for, for a, lot, a lot of cool poster art, including a lot of the the, the Bruce Lee knockoff films where Bruce Lee died. Uh, Enter Three Dragons, he did the art for. The Death of Bruce Lee, he did the art for. Uh, Sister Street Fighter, which is not a like Bruce Lee movie, but he did the art for that. Um... He did a, ooh, where's this at? He did a Bruce Lee, the man, the myth, uh, starring Bruce Lai. You know, again, he did a lot of these Bruce Lee knockoff films, posters. It's pretty dope. It's a pretty cool part of history. But if you, uh, really cool stuff he did that you guys may know, he did the poster art for William Girdler's, William Girdler's Grizzly, um, with the big, big bear, you know, you love his jaws with claws, y'all. If y'all don't love Grizzly... Uh, what's wrong with you people? Uh, Death Promise is is a okay exploitation movie. He did the art for that. Uh, boom, 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 boom. Westworld. He did the poster art for that with with um with freaking uh, Yul Brynner with the robot face. Pretty freaking terrifying. And uh, last but certainly not least, you know, amongst other things, he did the poster art for Phantom of the, Par- Phantom of the Paradise. And and that's um that's loved amongst many people. And I, I'm one of those people. So. Neil Adams, you know, for for all the special time you've given me over the years, I got to meet you a couple of times over the years. Uh, I think if you and Mr. George Perez died this year, it'd be a very sad time for the comic book world. And I'm thinking about it right now because he's got like stage four cancer, y'all. Just keep losing these grades. I mean, it's not just Stan Lee you should be blowing. I, I mean, <laughs> people are like, oh, you're picking on poor Stan Lee again. No, I'm not picking on poor Stan Lee again, but there's more... 
there's more to, to love out there that you guys sh- sh- should know. And, um, yeah, go, go, go check out Neil Adams' work. I'm sure there's many uh, appendices that have his work in there that you can buy, trade paperbacks, outright back issues just sitting at your... Uh, your um your stores your comic book stores please support your comic book stores as I'm recording this this is Friday the next day is free comic book day the first the first Saturday in May is free comic book day now what what that is is they they the distributors of the comics give these stores um a bunch of free books like like promotional free books for your kids to come inside and to to get and you know but this is meant for you to go into the store and support those stores that are fucking dying. And it makes me sad. It makes me sad in my cockles, in my subcockle area, um, that, that this is a thing uh, that comic book stores are dying. Because uh, there's not there's one around me that's maybe it's still it's still a little ways away. But you know what? You, you need to support them. Go go buy your cards without humanity. Go buy your your magic packs. Go buy all this stuff from your local store. Don't go to fucking Target. Don't. I, I, this bears repeating. Don't fucking go to those places to get this stuff. I hide shit at those stores when I see it there. <laughs> okay? Strange to say, but this is what, I, what I'm passionate about. Ce- celebrating the, the, the little man, you know, and helping him out. I mean, geez louise, man. I mean, they're dying. Where, where would kids go to hang out? You know, they, they want to be adventurous and hang out with other, you know, like-minded nerds like themselves. Public service announcement, you know, and uh, so many more things. And uh, last but not least, you know, we, we discussed, you know, depression in a major way on on the My, Mighty Wind review. It was really a, a little short thing. But you know what? If you're feeling, you know, that low, if you feel you need somebody to talk to, you know, now in, in the age we live in, that the, there's more and more opportunities for you to find somebody to talk to if your loved ones aren't good enough. Uh, they have... You know, therapists online, like Zoom meeting therapists, you you can talk, you can talk to. Of course, the the the, the suicide hotline. If you're if you're that you're that uh, you know down, you know, it, it, you can you can call them, I guess. Um, and that that number, I'm gonna give it to you right now. Uh, available 24 hours a day. Uh, 800-273-8255. If you're in the states, I mean, people people get sad all the time. I'm one of those people, and this is why you probably won't hear from me for. You'll hear from me soon, but like there's those times where there've been long gaps in this show. It's just I've been feel I feel down, and I, I don't want to talk to the people that I love and push that push that evil on them. I I don't, I don't want to do that. But you know what? It helps talk to people. And uh, this this I've always said this podcast is my best therapy, and it it has been. It's got me out of some some dumpy some dumpy skanky situations mm-hmm. and. If you feel the need, you need to talk to somebody, fuck it, hit me up. I mean, that's fine. I'm, 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 I'm a, I can't say I've been there all the way, but I, I'm a good listener. So, so uh, as uh, Jerry Springer would would say, you know, take care of yourself and each other. I'm gonna say that too, because it's, it's very, it's very important. Um, and then a down note. Let's 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 not do that. Thank you for eight great years. Uh, l- look for the next episode, which should be part three. Of this and the final part, where we uh, discuss for your consideration with uh, Derek Boo Boo Bourgeois and mascots with one with one court psyops, and then me and Ricky will have one more episode of Cripple Theater for you, um, uh, sandwiched in the middle of those two reviews, and uh, that'll be part three. And then um, after that, I'm gonna move on to, to d- doing some shows without my co-host if they don't want to show up, because I'm, I'm gonna give them a Brian opportunity to have a break. If they don't want to take a little break, they can join in with uh, whoever else I have on the show. But I'm going to record some surplus shows. I got Kate and Matt from the eternal eternal sunshine of the not-so-spotless mind. See, I almost messed it up too, Heather. See what I did there? Uh, they're going to come on for, for two films um, where there's uh, specters in the electricity, perhaps. Uh, we're going to do Ghost in the Machine from 1993. And Pulse, I think from 1986. Not the Asian one, the American one with Cliff DeYoung and a young Joey Lawrence. It's Joey Lawrence. It might be Matthew Lawrence. I, I forget which, which Lawrence brother it is, but electricity is alive inside the house and it's killing people. There's no explanation and I, I kind of love. Uh, you'll hear that coming soon. I hope to get Dan and Gab on the show um, very soon. Um, Cameron, I'm sure, will be on the show. There's plans to do another Beef, uh, Beef Out of the Cannon episode. 
with Lee Russell, and hopefully uh, Lady Lee Hardy will be with us. We're going to do the Apple and uh, America 3000 together, like uh, two different kinds of post-apocalyptic movies in uh, canon style. Sasquatch on the roller skates. Got, gotta love it. But uh, anyway, I'll, I'll leave uh, much more spoilers to that. But um, I have a list of shows that I think I know which one that Dan Bone will want to pick. I'm just going to throw it out there. Uh, this has been your Cinebeef Podcast, where if you've got beef, I've got the grinder. Thanks for listening. <laughs>